The same animals that strike terror in the hearts of swimmers generate excitement with many scuba divers. In an ironic twist, divers deliberately seek face-to-face -face encounters with some of the ocean's most dangerous predators, sharks. Dr. Eric Ritter is a leading authority on shark behavior and a passionate supporter of human and shark interaction. In the spring of 2002, he paid a very high price for his beliefs. A severe attack nearly cost him his leg and his life. Sharks fuel a booming ecotourism industry. From tropical seas to the cold waters of the Pacific Northwest, sharks are big business. feeding frenzy, a fascinating and frightening spectacle. Dozens of predators slash and tear at their prey with razor-sharp teeth. But this exciting display is not a random act in nature's grand design. It's a carefully choreographed event staged for the benefit of scuba divers. It's a fair assumption that most people would avoid intentional contact with sharks, but many scuba divers and snorkelers line up to interact with the animals. Believe it or not, shark encounters are becoming one of the most popular attractions in the sport. above the rest in our collective imaginations. The Great White. Even though human fatalities have decreased, the visceral horror of being eaten alive remains. Since the dawn of time, people have been terrified of sharks. But in a deeply primitive sense, we admire them. We're transfixed by predators that can kill us. This fascination is the inspiration for the holy grail of shark dives. The Cape of Good Hope, one of the most treacherous bodies of water on Earth. Winter storms work their way north from Antarctica and pound a battered coastline. Windswept shores provide refuge for tens of thousands of South African fur seals. On land, they are clumsy and slow. Underwater, the nimble seals are eager to show off their acrobatic skills. These seas are not safe for even the most agile pinniped. This is the hunting ground of the Great White.
In the South African fishing village of Hansbai, great whites fuel a burgeoning dive tourism industry. J.P. Bota and Andre Hartman operate Marine Dynamics, one of the most successful shark diving companies in the country. Both were formerly commercial fishermen, but with dwindling catches, they turned to eco-tourism, specifically shark tourism. Their business plan is simple. Wait for good weather, ferry visitors out to sea, and get them up close and personal with great whites. The South African white shark diving business around Khanspai started in the early 90s. In the beginning, there were only three operators. It grew to the eight operators we have at the moment. Initially, there was a sort of an emotional outcry and people were really concerned that the number of, of shark attacks would increase due to the commercial activity of attracting sharks. That fortunately has proved to be a false fear. This activity does not necessarily lead to more shark attack. And of course, the statistics have also been with us so that the number of shark attacks have actually not increased. The local economy has benefited quite substantially by the shark tourism. The industry employs about 40 to 50 people and these people spend their money in the local businesses. So there's a lot of spin-offs emanating from the shark business. To attract the sharks, Andre Hartman first chums the water with a pungent combination of blood and fish remains. The scent of cow shark liver is a particular favorite of great whites. Coaxing them to the stern, Andre demonstrates an unusual phenomenon. Pushing aside the snout of a shark one day, he discovered that the animal became almost catatonic. It rolled its eyelids down, rose out of the water, opened its mouth and snapped its jaws. The strange behavior appears to be related to highly specialized sensory organs in their nose and mouth. Touching them momentarily short circuits their senses. Most customers view sharks from the safe confines of a boat or from a protective cage. But a few brave souls pay extra for the privilege of venturing into the water without the security of steel bars. At the surface, Andre Hartman acts as a safety diver and occasionally shows off. Do not try this at home. On the sea floor, a cautious Hartman scents the water with fish blood. The diver's expectations are exceeded. A 15-foot white shark appears like a ghostly apparition. We were underwater for about 40 minutes, and of course the action all happens near the end of the dive. We were starting to get cold. Water temperature there was about 52, 53 degrees. And you're looking through the small viewfinder and trying to keep it framed and focus, and the shark comes out of the gloom and simply just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and fills the frame on this high-definition camera. It's pretty awe-inspiring. That shark swam right around us a couple times, looked at us, examined us, then made a pass across the bottom and right at the camera. Sharks don't have fingers and hands to test things with, so what they have to do is bite something. 
Unfortunately, because of their enormous size and tremendous strength, when they bite something, even though they're just sampling it and you really couldn't consider that a shark attack, it doesn't make much difference to the person that's been sampled. It still hurts. The shark showed recent signs of mating activity. Deep scars along her side indicated a bite from a very large male. We can only speculate on the size of the animal that inflicted these wounds. It seems like the more time I spend in the water with sharks, the more I realize that when you look into their eyes as they swim by you, and eye contact is very important with wildlife, there's someone in there. It's not just a stupid animal swimming by. Sharks are not maniacal or dangerous man-eating machines that are swimming around looking for humans to eat. They're really not. In the Bahamas, over a hundred sharks show up for a feeding. But how do you get out of the way of a frenzied mob? At the northernmost tip of the Bahamas, 100 miles east of the Florida coast, lies Walker's Key. The island is a renowned sport fishing destination and hosts thousands of visitors each year. Seizing on the availability of leftover fish parts, shark diving pioneer Gary Atkison found a novel means of recycling normally discarded carcasses. We're a premier fishing destination. Subsequently, as the fish would come into our fish cleaning room, uh, we save those carcasses. We recycle those fish heads and, and carcasses back into the environment. One day, my staff came up to me and said, uh, Gary, when we go down to dump the carcasses at the end of the runway, the sharks hear the trucks coming, and they gather. Well, I took a look at this and was astounded by it. And I thought, well, it'd be a natural progression then to relocate it out to the reef. And subsequently, that's what we did. We started saving the carcasses, packing them, created the chum sickle. Basically, with the chum sickle is carcass feeding, which is very natural for this predator. So we wanted to present it to him in as natural a form as possible that he would understand. And in no way then would it also connect it to us as the diver, that we were, we were gonna be uh, just viewed as another predator down there on the dive who showed up for the same reason they did. And that's why we can do the dive as safely as we do it and why we've never had a single incident of agonistic display in 11 years. Probably 35,000 people have done this experience, including children as young as four years old, uh, having animals within just uh, a few feet of them. At the dive site, the captain revs the boat's engines. The noise is a cue for the sharks that a feeding is about to begin. Hold it right there. As the frozen block of bait sinks, only a few sharks appear to be interested. Other fish are quick to take advantage of the free meal. Once thought to be set off by a single drop of blood, the infamous feeding frenzy may instead be incited by several different stimuli. The vibrations and head shaking of the first fish to feed, the scent trail, and the visual commotion all combine to excite the sharks.
As the bait ball wears down, it eventually falls to the bottom. The sharks then fight for the remaining morsels of food. Full of well-publicized attacks in 2001 spawned the Summer of the Shark. Overnight, shark bites and sightings became front-page news. Lost in the hype was the fact that there were far fewer attacks that year than the previous year. Worldwide, only four deaths were attributed to sharks in 2001. The summer of the shark dramatically changed public perception, taking it several steps backward to the old Jaws mentality of the 70s. The past quarter century since that landmark film has not been kind to sharks. Virtually all species have seen population declines of between 50 and 90 percent. The strain on their numbers comes primarily from overfishing. Federal regulations restrict shark fishing in U.S. waters, but the animals are targeted relentlessly in much of the world. Their cartilage is still considered a cancer treatment, and Asian demand for shark fin soup supports a wasteful finning industry. One of the main goals of diving operators such as Gary Atkinson at Walker's Key is to increase awareness of the shark's plight through interaction with the animals in their natural habitat. I think it's so vitally important that people learn as much as they can about an animal that is really misunderstood. In doing this experience and, and trying to educate people and hopefully stop the slaughter of these sharks, I feel that what we do is significant. The reason we do what we do is it's a myth exploder. People suddenly realize that, she was. I'm down here with 100 animals and I'm safe and they could care less that I'm here. And they walk away with a whole different rich experience than they ever thought they'd get when they first arrived here. That's the seed you're planting out there because they're gonna tell other people. Sharks have a bad rap as it is anyway. And I feel like our job here is to let people know that they're not the bad guy people have made them out to be. If sharks are not the bad guys, why would they attack and nearly kill one of their staunchest supporters? Dr. Eric Ritter is a leading authority on shark behavior and a forensic investigator of shark attacks. Ritter has been instrumental in helping to change the popular perception of sharks as terrors of the sea to a vital species which deserves protection. Over the past two decades, Eric has introduced hundreds of students, photographers, and biologists to sharks. With a keen passion for the animals and their plight, he is one of few researchers who dares to freely swim with dangerous sharks. Ritter works exclusively outside the protection of a cage. What I'm studying is the body language of sharks. I'm interested in how sharks express their intentions when they approach humans. Shark-human interaction is a very new field, but it's most likely the very field we need to understand these animals. You cannot just observe them by sitting on boats, sitting in front of aquariums. We have to interact with them. My main theory is that sharks are as predictable as dogs, parrots, cats. Animals that we are comfortable with, animals that we are used to. We're not used to be with sharks. We have to just give them the chance to let them interact with us. In a unique experiment at Walker's Key, 
Gary Atkinson and Dr. Ritter attract a handful of large sharks to shallow water. One of Eric's more controversial theories is that dangerous animals like bull and lemon sharks are not inclined to attack humans, even when enticed with bait. He believes attacks are caused by curiosity or mistaken identity and should be referred to more appropriately as shark accidents. More than 80% of attack victims survive, mainly because sharks realize their mistake and don't return for a second bite. Ritter simulates common attack scenarios, such as those on swimmers in shallow water and those on spear fishermen in deeper seas. Throughout his experiments, fish carcasses are thrown into the surf very near to where he stands or swims. The most often seen action scenario we have is through exploratory behavior, meaning the animal sees us, not us as a human being, but us as an object. Several factors come together, for example, sound, smell, motion of the object. Sharks, per se, are very curious animals. They have a very high level of hesitance, but if their curiosity takes over, at the end, they may grab an object just to get a final idea of what the object could be, because nothing they sense is conclusive. So that's why, in very rare cases, they still grab the object. In the spring of 2002, after nearly two decades and over a thousand dives with dangerous sharks, Eric's luck finally ran out. He was severely bitten on the leg by a bull shark. A journalist accompanying Eric nervously paced and stirred up debris, reducing visibility. Quickly, the situation turned deadly. A large female bull shark was cornered between the two and lashed out at Eric. What led to this bite that I had with the bull shark was one of a general situation we've done hundreds and hundreds of times. The person next to me did not stand still as I told him to. He walked back and forth and so by walking back and forth, he stirred up a lot of sand. And so we lowered the visibility. So it was us who created the situation, not the animals. The second I got bitten, I lifted my leg right away because I had to get out of her mouth. And the problem is if you have a 400 pound animal attached to you, there's nearly nothing you can do. I mean, you always hear, well, hit an animal, do this, that, that doesn't work. She let go, I looked at my leg, and I realized, um, first of all, it's not much left, and second of all, I knew I'm gonna die within the next two or three hours because I've seen many of these wounds, and I knew how they're gonna end if they do not get proper treatment. Eric was fortunate. A small plane and its pilot were on the island at the time of the accident. Within 30 minutes of the bite, he was on his way to West Palm Beach, where a team of doctors was waiting. He nearly died due to an enormous loss of blood. Once stabilized, it appeared that he would lose his leg, but skilled surgeons miraculously managed to save it. Months of rehabilitation and a determined will spurred an amazing recovery. Additional reconstructive surgeries and skin grafts help to restore use of his leg. The first time I jumped back in the water was about four months after my bite. The wound healed so far that I could be in the water 15, 20 minutes. So the first opportunity I had, I jumped right back in at the very spot where I got bitten. I want that everybody sees these animals the way I see them. I want them to see the animal through my eyes. I see it even more clear what we have to do. 
we have to destroy the myth, the bad rap of these animals, portray them the way they really are. They're fascinating, incredibly intelligent, curious. So I'm back in the water. I interact with sharks more than ever. So I'd say I do this for the rest of my life. What is the fastest growing and most popular attraction for scuba diving tourists? Another Bahamian island is the epicenter of the shark diving industry. At New Providence, half a dozen scuba operations rely on sharks as a main attraction for diving tourists. As for the sharks, what we don't want you guys doing is swimming with your hands, okay? These sharks are attracted to movement more than the blood in the water. Unlike the bait ball style of feeding at Walker's Key, sharks here are fed by hand or with a steel pole. Shark wranglers utilize a chainmail suit which helps prevent injury, but a crushing bite can still hurt. The difficult part initially is to keep the ravenous animals away from the bait. Like pigs at the trough, they jostle for position. After using a pole, the wrangler moves towards the divers and feeds by hand. For the customers, this close-up action is a thrilling introduction to sharks. It was pretty comfortable down there uh, until the sharks got real close to you. I mean, I got pretty nervous. I've always thought they were pretty aggressive, but being down there today while they were feeding them and everything, they looked like gentle giants down there. This dive is really, really good. Never been so close to sharks. Other divers have seen them in the, in the blue, in the distance, but never, never so close up. It's almost like he was roughhousing dogs. Whenever a couple of sharks would come up to him and he would just push their snoot away or whatnot, he'd grab a hold of them and roughhouse them and pet them, so it was pretty neat. The first thing this morning, we never would have known that we were going to be shark diving today, that's for sure. We just uh, happened to run across it and it sounded like a cool thing to do, so we said, ah, let's go shark diving. It was just a fantastic experience. From an economic standpoint, shark feeding I'm very much in favor of. Some people don't approve of shark feeding. They feel that we've changed the behavior of sharks. Yes, to a certain degree we have. Taking this area, we've probably changed the behavior of about 100 uh, sharks, slightly. But they're still in their own environment. They generate a lot of income for the Bahamas, and those same sharks generate revenue year in, year out. Shark feeding is definitely becoming more popular, and it definitely does contribute towards the conservation of sharks. These people who would have otherwise viewed them as dangerous man-eaters and not cared about them, once they've been on a feed, they've seen them feeding, they're seeing they're not these vicious creatures, they're far more inclined to support conservation issues. Most shark encounters occur in the warm tropics, but what animals lurk in the cold, deep sea? Shark diving is not confined to the tropics or to shallow temperate waters. In the dark, frigid realm of the deep sea lives a mysterious giant, the six-gill shark. 
ancient hunters, unchanged since dinosaurs roamed the earth, they inhabit great depths. These living fossils can attain a length of over 20 feet. There are only a handful of places where six-gill sharks are frequently encountered in shallow water. Washington State's Puget Sound and the Pacific coast of Canada. One of the best places to photograph and study the sharks at scuba diving depths is British Columbia's Hornby Island. Zelinsky and Amanda Heath operate a busy scuba diving business on Hornby Island, and six gills are their number one attraction. Despite the cold seas and sometimes challenging diving conditions, the animals generate enormous interest. The main reason that people come to Hornby is to see the six gill sharks. They're a real draw here in the summer. We cater to about uh, 500 diving tourists uh, in the course of May to September and all of those people come with the intent of seeing the six gills if they're lucky enough to do so. Hornby Island is a unique location in that it's one of the few places in the world where we can observe six gills in water shallow enough to scuba dive in. In many cases they're found at depths of uh, several thousand feet which is unreachable by people under most circumstances. Sport diver tourists come here, as well as uh, scientists, film crews, uh, still photographers, etc., who are interested in an opportunity to see the six gill in its natural habitat. Researcher Dr. Robert Dunbrack of Newfoundland's Memorial University searches for clues to the behavior and biology of these enigmatic sharks. Each summer aboard his research vessel, the Stalvik, Dumbrack travels to tiny Flora Islet off the coast of Hornby Island. Six gills and their unusual habits pose many intriguing questions, but simply finding the elusive animals is the first of many challenges. It was much more difficult than we originally thought it might be to work on the six skills. We thought we could just do a bit of diving and the six skills would be there and we could make behavioral observations in a way that we might do on, let's say, polar bears or some sort of terrestrial mammal. The study site that we settled on was on floor islets off Hornby Island. We spent a few days there on our research vessel looking for sharks and didn't see anything and we were prepared then to leave and go and find another site. But on the, our last dive we saw eight sharks in one dive so that as soon as we saw that we decided this was a place to do the work. The unanswered question about these sharks of course is why are they coming into shallow water? They're deep water sharks, they're known virtually throughout all the oceans of the world but only from deep waters. Well, a natural thing to conclude is that they're coming in to feed because this is what animals have to do most of the time is look for food, but we have no evidence that they are feeding. It's not known whether they feed at night and maybe come onto the reef during the day for some other reason. Dunbrack quickly realized that direct observation of the animals was very difficult depth and time constraints, cold water and currents, and finally locating the sharks on the deep reef made research a daunting task. To aid in his studies, he devised two ingenious yet simple methods of observing and recording six gills and their behavior. 
We have built a time-lapse video system that allows us to put a video camera down. It takes pictures, four frames, every 10 seconds or so. On a single film, we're able to get two to three to four weeks, depending on the time of year. It's just a daylight system. We also have set up a stereo system which consists of two video cameras that are cabled directly to the surface. They look over the same area, they're facing down off the reef fall, and so the sharks will, will swim underneath these two cameras. And based on the geometry of the cameras, we can actually get measurements, direct measurements of the size of the sharks as they pass underneath, and also their swimming speed, which we can use for metabolic studies. Early in the summer field season, Dunbrack made a curious discovery. Harbor seals and stellar sea lions, prey for other large sharks, were interacting with the six gills. Video monitors and time-lapse cameras reveal the startling behavior. Ooh, and what was that be? Oh, that's interesting. That's a seal, right? A seal. Chasing him. <laughs> I don't believe this. Wow, it's amazing. Seals directly underneath the shark, sort of coming underneath them, is sort of buzzing him. Six gill sharks are not known to feed on seals or sea lions. It appears that the playful mammals are simply curious about their large visitors from the deep. In recent years, fossil remains of prehistoric relatives of six gill sharks have been discovered on Hornby Island. Over 25 species of mostly deep water sharks from the Cretaceous period have been identified from fossilized remains. Fossil shark teeth are very common but they're usually attributed to shallow water species. These puzzling clues appear to suggest that six gills and many other deep water sharks frequently ventured into shallow seas. Within a stone's throw of the site where we were watching these sharks swim around, there are fossils of the sharks that have been there over 65 million years ago. And looking at the teeth of those species, they're virtually indistinguishable from the teeth of the fish that we were looking at. Within the last 100 million years or so, they probably haven't changed much at all. It's a very With the collapse of many traditional commercial fish stocks, six gills were briefly considered a viable new fishery. But with little knowledge of their population, reproductive and growth rates, this ill-conceived plan was put on hold. Trying to run a fishery on a species like the six gill is very problematic. It's a large fish, it's certainly long-lived and has very low rates of reproduction, so the sustainable exploitation rates would be very low. So a large shark that might be 60 to 100 years old might fetch just a few dollars. Whereas we do know for a fact that this species probably brings in several million dollars a year just to the dive tourism industry as a living resource. The more people that interact with the sharks in a passive manner as divers and get a positive experience, the, the better it is really going to be for the shark. Despite many unanswered questions and an uncertain future, six gill sharks inspire tremendous respect from both scientists and scuba divers. Rob and I consider ourselves to be very lucky in that we're members of a very small select group that have seen a lot of six gill swimming in its natural habitat. It's something that many people can never dream of doing. It's an exciting thing to see this shark moving in its environment. 
it's really hard to describe the feelings that you have when you first encounter them. To put it in terrestrial terms, it would be similar to going through a hike in the West Coast and running into the elephants and the giant sloths that used to live there 12,000 years ago. It seems like a throwback to times when animals were bigger and more plentiful on these reefs. And it's a very stirring experience. There's virtually nothing that we know about this species, so anything that we get is going to be useful, and there's so much to know. It's something that could keep us going for many, many, many years. Many of us don't scuba dive or even snorkel. What better way to satiate our curiosity than to view sharks through six inches of glass? Shark encounters are not the exclusive domain of scuba divers and marine biologists. The animals are also top attractions in zoos and aquariums. The public fascination with sharks is deeply rooted. People of all ages are mesmerized by the sleek and powerful fish. At the Atlantis Resort on Paradise Island in the Bahamas, sharks are a crowd favorite. You can even rocket down a water slide or river raft through the middle of their Mayan shark tank. I think the reason why people are so fascinated by sharks is because a lot of people don't know about sharks. They have a lot of misconceptions about sharks. They think sharks are these big, scary animals um, that as soon as you get into the water, they're going to attack you. Economically, live sharks are much more valuable than dead sharks because they bring guests here. They want to see sharks, and it also adds an educational value because it's much easier to teach somebody about sharks and how valuable they are if they can actually see something that's living. I think people appreciate that much more than they would seeing a specimen or just a photograph in a book. A rash of shark attacks in Florida and Hawaii led state authorities there to ban the practice of baiting sharks. But instead of decreasing attacks, the bans have proven to be ineffective. The same number of people were bitten in the past few years as there were before the bans were implemented. Although shark diving does attract and perhaps alter the behavior of a few animals, feedings usually take place in deeper water, a long way from beaches and swimmers. Dr. Eric Ritter and others believe that shark baiting and chumming is a potential factor in attacks but not because of scuba divers. I would say about 80 to 90% are caused by sport fishing. What they create is a very hazardous situation around themselves by chumming the water, by hooking fish. Sharks pick it up. You have people in the water frolicking until we find a way to reduce some of the sport fishing habits. We will always have the same number of shark bites on a yearly basis here in Florida. If the band really would have done what they predicted, meaning no accidents anymore, then at least it would be safer, but we still have the same accident rate each year. I definitely feel that organized shark feeding done properly is safe. And it definitely raises awareness of this animal's plight and raises awareness of the animal's fragility, and it's a myth destroyer. Is an animal that's been on this planet for close to half a billion years that has been brought to the verge of extinction in the past 20 years. And he's being wiped out at such a tremendous rate. You remove the shark, you suddenly turn our oceans in a very, very short period of time into a septic system. Our oceans are in trouble. If we don't protect this animal, then all of us lose, everybody. 
and what a sad thing. I want my kids to see what I saw today. Despite their strength and predatory skill, sharks are remarkably fragile creatures. Conservation efforts have traditionally had little support or enforcement. They aren't as cute and cuddly as dolphins or as majestic as whales. After all, on rare occasions, they do kill people. We are slowly coming to realize that sharks are integral members of the ocean food chain. We're learning that while a dead shark may bring a few dollars to a fisherman one time, a live shark may generate thousands of dollars in annual tourist revenue. And best of all, the shark is allowed to live. Perhaps scuba divers and other eco-tourists can ultimately play a key role in preserving these vital species. It's difficult to imagine. Some people want to see big sharks in the water, especially photographers. These animals are some of the most iconic photo subjects in the sea. But how do you get close to them? For decades, it's been done with chumming, attracting the sharks with bait. The practice is now being questioned, even banned in many countries, because of a dramatic increase in attacks. White sharks' main food sources, seals and sea lions, are on the move. Global warming and other factors are driving both their prey and the sharks into new territory. And sometimes, we're right in their paths. At Mexico's Guadalupe Island, deep water cages provide a fisheye view of great whites. At depth and with minimal baiting, the animals display a surprisingly calm and curious nature. Through satellite and acoustic tagging, researcher Dr. Mauricio Hoyos studies great white migration and behavior. Two other large pelagic sharks, hammerheads and oceanic white tips, are facing grave declines in their numbers. Like great whites, the fins of these increasingly rare sharks are in high demand for shark fin soup. New international laws now ban commercial trade in these species. But will the measures be effective protection for these endangered animals? In April 2012, a champion South African surfer was killed by a great white. Shark tourism operators and filmmakers were initially blamed. Both groups were chumming in the area at the time of the attack. The baiting of sharks is possibly a factor in some fatalities. But there are other issues to consider, such as the changing migration patterns of their prey species, and there are more of us in the water than ever. There have been more deadly white shark attacks in the past two years than in the past two decades combined. What's going on? The thing about shark fatalities is they're spectacular and they command the media. They are going to lead on the front page. If it bleeds, it leads. So what's going on is there are more of us. This is a busy planet. We've passed seven billion people and a lot of us like to be in the water. And the fact is that other marine mammals like to be in the water in many of the same places and they're prey species for large sharks, particularly white sharks. We are recreating in areas where there are big pinniped populations and people are surfing there, people are diving and snorkeling, free diving, swimming. 
We're living in the neoprene era now. And when you take a pink ape and you clad them in neoprene and you put them in the water and they're floating on the surface, they look an awful lot like a seal from underneath. So I think a lot of what we're seeing in shark attack and white shark attack particularly is mistaken identity. Dr. Chris Harvey Clark is a shark researcher and the director of animal care at the University of British Columbia. His studies with other large cold water animals such as six gill and Greenland sharks show they have many similarities to great whites. Most species' behavior, even our own, is primarily driven by the urge to eat. It's all about the food. Pinniped populations are growing in some areas, and certainly Central California, um, some of the Pacific Islands, around Australia, around New Zealand, populations are protected, so they're growing. They're outstripping local food resources and moving around, and with them move the large predators. So you may see white sharks occurring in places they haven't been before, and of course these are also places where people in the water, they're surfing, they're snorkeling, and inadvertently being bumped and attacked by white sharks. The increase in great white attacks is clearly more about more of us being in the water near their prey species. And although the baiting of sharks remains a contentious issue, the practice helps fuel a growing industry, shark tourism. We just departed at Ensenada, Baja California North, heading down to Guadalupe now heading uh, south-southwest, 185 nautical miles. A uh, beautiful day today. Hopefully it stays that way. Not always like this. <laughs> Historically, there were just a handful of locations where you could regularly see great whites up close, primarily South Africa, Australia, and California. White sharks, though, are rarely encountered in these places now or conditions are so challenging, it's nearly impossible to get in the water with them. Mexico's remote Guadalupe Island is the premier destination in the booming business of white shark tourism. And if you're putting people in the water with great whites, you need to protect them. These cages we have are, are tough cages. I'd put these cages up against any shark on the planet, and I, I have no doubt that we would be safe inside there. I'm personally inside the cages every day too, so I wouldn't put our guests in, in these cages if I didn't think they're safe, so they're, they're extremely tough, yeah. Although the cages are made of aluminum, they're still incredibly heavy and dangerous to maneuver. Okay, we'll take the surface cage next, guys. Even in calm seas, lifting them with a hydraulic crane is a delicate operation. All right, clear that line, guys. I believe this is our third season now with these submersible cages, and it really offers a different perspective to see a shark swimming above you or even approaching the cage from above. Watch yourself there, Bob. Swings right at you. At first light, it's time to deploy the cages. You're gonna pick it up. You're gonna swing it. And you're gonna lower it right here. You wanna boom down a little bit? In addition to the two deep units, there are two surface cages. Ciao, Essay. It's a full charter, and there are lots of guests. All four cages will be busy. Pool is almost open. It's a big job to ensure customers are well equipped and safe. The dive deck is cluttered with dive gear and support crew. Okay, up slow. Let's do it. I've been diving all over the world, and I am so excited to do this dive. I've done wrecks, I've done reefs, I've done it all. Now I get to do the ultimate, diving with the great white sharks. I am so excited. Okay, this is a regulator. What's that? Regulator, what's that? Oh, leak out. Guests breathe air through a regulator, much like scuba divers. But instead of using tanks, compressed gas is supplied from the surface. 
Each diver needs to be heavily weighted to stay firmly at the bottom of the cages. I've done a lot of diving in Hawaii, French Polynesia, Great Barrier Reef, and on this boat at Socorro. But great white sharks, this is a first. All right, folks, two-person gauge is ready if you want to start loading up. First okay. dive of the trip. Rock and roll. Oh, this is nice water. You want to watch putting your hand right there because it's a pinch point, OK? OK, all right. Bill, there's nobody I would rather take. <laughs> Here's your regulator. Okay. When you get down to the bottom of the cage, I'll hand you the camera. Just step away from the ladder and make room for Jan. Okay. I've been at this 46 years diving out in the ocean, but I've never ever seen or dived or even filmed the great white. So I'm ready to go. This is really exciting for me. And white sharks are dream animals for most photographers. Even though the crew no longer baits with a chum slick or bloody fish parts, the sharks show up soon after the cages are deployed. The big animals seem more relaxed, perhaps even curious at depth. The combination of deeper cages and less baiting seems to be a great success. Our two submersible cages are a little different from your standard surface cages that most people are familiar with. We lower those down depth of 10 meters. We use hydraulic winches, which are on the stern, and uh, we have a crew member that, that operate each cage. They're operated from the surface, one crew member lowering them down, lowering them back up again also. They have a lot of backup systems in case of emergency, in case of something happens. They're equipped with ballast tanks, so that if we do need to bring the cage up before the scheduled time, the uh, dive master can blow those ballast tanks with air and the cage will come at a controlled rate up to the surface. If we get cut off from the surface supplied air for some reason, then we have backups. We have uh, scuba tanks down there that we can use to, to fill the tanks and also to, uh, to breathe off of. Well, the idea behind the submersible cage is that we get to observe the sharks in their more natural environment, as opposed to the past in the, the surface cages, where the idea was to be throwing buckets of blood, throwing chunks of tuna, and luring them in close to the surface cage. And the behavior you see from the surface cage is that behavior, the sharks agitated, excited from the chumming. The submersible cages, on the other hand, you've got a cage full of people down there, you've got lots of heartbeats, lots of electromagnetic activity. The sharks are attracted to that, but in a different way than they are to the blood. They're not so excited, they're curious, they come cruise around the cages, they're very deliberate in their motions, move very slowly, and you get to see the white shark as they truly are, as opposed to the white shark that's most often portrayed on TV and movies like Jaws. After a couple of dives, the sharks start to get bolder. They circle tighter and tighter to the cages. For guests, it's what they came for, a thrilling close-up encounter with the infamous Great White. The sharks get so close, you could reach out and touch them. But that's not a very good idea. Oh, that was awesome. There were three sharks circling around and circling very slowly, smoothly, but they come in closer, close past the reef, almost reaching with your hands. I didn't try though. It's my fourth season out here diving with the white sharks, and uh, I've, I've never been sick of it. I don't think I can say I've ever been bored down there. In fact, um, every time I'm getting ready to go in, I'm, I'm excited to see the sharks again, you know? It's, it's some of my favorite diving to do. The youngest shark diver was 14-year-old Samantha Morrow. The Canadian teenager logged more dives than most of the guests. See you later. Yeah. 
Even though the water was a bit chilly, it was challenging to drag many of the guests out of the cages. They couldn't get enough of the enigmatic animals. And divers got a once-in-a-lifetime close-up experience with great whites. Nowadays, uh, we're not feeding the sharks, we're not wrangling the sharks, and we're not putting heavy slicks of chum in the water to, to get the sharks to the cages. However, occasionally we do put a hang bait down to put a little scent in the water to bring the sharks in. If we want to show the sharks to these people and educate people about the sharks, then it's something really that I feel that we have to do to bring the sharks to us and, and keep them there. The current law is that you can't use any two and any cent in the water. However, uh, this year, just this season, they have decided to allow you to apply for a permit to use a certain amount of tuna to attract the sharks. The sharks really do come in close, even with minimal baiting. Amazing, there's so many close-up sharks. It's probably like three or four. Congratulations, Sambo. There's big shark dive. <laughs> you made it. Got all your fingers? Yeah. Okay, that's all that counts, isn't it? Oh man, that was unbelievable. That's the second dive today, and it was better than the first one. More sharks, bigger and closer. They were huge, huge, gorgeous animals. We should have brought our shark dental floss. There are some people who feel that any form of baiting should be banned. It's clear, though, the sharks would likely not approach closely without an incentive. A simple hang bait is usually enough to draw the great whites close to the cages. The sharks are intensely curious animals, and even though they're a bit calmer with less baiting, it can still be an unnerving experience. Mauricio Hoyos is fascinated with white sharks. As a university student, he wanted to make the animals the focus of his doctorate. But there were supposedly very few of the animals in Mexican waters. Mauricio, Senore, welcome. Good day. Bien, bien. Tú? Muy bien, muy bien. Ya leo. Yes, yes. I spoke with my advisor and I told him I would love to study the white shark. But he told me, Mauricio, we don't have a lot of white sharks in Mexican waters. That was in uh, 2000. And two years after that, we found out that we have the best place to see white sharks in the world. And that's why I have been in Guadalupe Island for nine years, and I would do anything to, to know more about them and to protect them. There are no permanent research facilities on the island, so Mauricio teams up with various tour boats as a ship naturalist. He's especially fond of working with children and introducing them to these amazing sharks. When I was a kid, I remember that uh, we went to the United States and my father gave me $20 and he told me, okay, this is all the money that I'm going to give you. You have to buy a lot of toys or whatever you want. And there was this small shark and it was $20. I bought it because I really wanted it. And my father was really upset because he told me, hey, that's all your money. You have to, you, you can buy a lot of different toys. No, no, I want that toy and I still have it because since I was a little kid, I loved sharks. When I saw the first shark, I, it was like the dream of my life came true. It was amazing. It was a huge female, maybe four meters long. And since then, I have been working here on this island every, every autumn. Guadalupe, it's a very special place because it's an island in the middle of nowhere and uh, it is influenced by the California current system that it has a lot of cold water, a lot of nutrients. Guadalupe's shark numbers appear to be growing. More new sharks means the population is thriving. There was a study and they wanted to know the number of sharks that we have year after year and I think that it is up to 130 sharks. But every year, I have seen new sharks. Most of them are juveniles, and that's very important for Guadalupe Island. Older established sharks sometimes don't return to the island. They may migrate somewhere else or die off. 
Seeing new juveniles indicates these animals are being born at Guadalupe or somewhere nearby, which is an encouraging sign. We have found that the males arrive to the island in July and females in September, October. They depart the island in February, most of them. But also we have found that some of them remain on the island for up to 10 months, in the case of the juveniles, for example. In Guadalupe, we have three different species of pinnipeds. The northern elephant seal, the Guadalupe fox seal, and the California sea lion. And that's one of the preferred prey sources of the white sharks, because they have a lot of fat, and fat has twice caloric value than proteins. So I have seen that in December, when the northern elephant seals are coming to the island to give birth and to mate, the sharks know that and they are waiting for them. But I have seen when they feed on a northern elephant seal and they finish it all. I was there in December and it attacked a female. She was maybe 800 kilograms. And the shark, it was a big female, more than five meters. And she killed the seal and she ate everything in front of me in less than 25 minutes. For a prey animal that's in constant peril, the seals here don't seem to be too concerned, as long as they can see the sharks. And if it gets a bit too scary for the seals, they sometimes even climb on the back of tour boats for protection. To gain a better understanding of the sharks' local movements and their long-distance migrations, Mauricio Hoyos uses high-tech tools such as satellite tags and acoustic transmitters. The devices reveal the shark's depths, migratory patterns, locations, and water temperatures. But even with advanced technology, there's still a lot we don't know about these enigmatic animals. In order to know the local movements of the sharks, we are using ultrasonic telemetry. We have to set ultrasonic transmitter in a shark and that transmitter is gonna emit a pulse that we can detect in two devices. Uh, one, that it's a portable receiver that we have in the boat. So as soon as I tag the shark, I have to follow that shark for 24 hours. Okay, Jorge, shark, bring it, bring it. Put it right here, right here. Okay, excellent. We are setting underwater receivers in several different parts of the island, and these receivers can get all the information and the storage of that information for up to one year. The white sharks at Guadalupe spend over half a year away from the island in open water between California and Hawaii. But what they're doing way out there remains a mystery. A few of the animals have been satellite tracked to a remote location in the middle of the Pacific, dubbed the Great White Cafe. It's thought that thousands of the sharks congregate each year at the mysterious spot. No one is even sure whether they are mating, chasing tuna, or even giving birth out there. For such a remarkably well-known creature, we actually know very little about them. But Mauricio Hoyos is determined to find out more. Yeah, the shark is not here. Maybe we can go a little bit to the north. Okay. Guadalupe is a protected biosphere of Mexico. Yet with minimal funding or monitoring, the sharks are under constant threat from poachers. And there's growing political pressure to restrict the activities of tourism operators. Baiting and chumming of white sharks remains a contentious issue. If the tourism operators are not allowed to attract the sharks, they won't go to the island again. There's a big problem with poachers. The Mexican Navy is doing a great job, but they cannot be there all the time. So these kind of boats are an extra set of eyes taking care of the sharks. So I think that we have to find a good way that it's good for the sharks and good for the tourism operators. I mean, not just ban the, the baiting, but let's do a study to find what would be the, the best way to attract the sharks without interfering with the natural behavior of the animals. 
Stills photographer David Fleetham is just one of a handful of image makers that earn their living taking pictures of marine animals. And one of his favorite subjects is sharks. For most amateurs and professionals, getting the perfect shark picture can be an obsession. His iconic image of a sandbar shark was the first and only underwater photo ever used on the cover of famed Life magazine. Great whites, though, are the holy grail of shark photos. The first time that I photographed a shark underwater was in British Columbia. It took several trips, but eventually at about 130 feet, I had this 12, maybe 14 foot long, six gill shark, huge girthy shark go swimming by me with really little interest shown in me whatsoever. I was hooked after that on shooting sharks. And then the next shark on the list was of course a, a great white. the great whites that are around Guadalupe Island. That spot has just really developed into what's gotta be the best place in the world to photograph great whites underwater. White sharks are the quintessential marine predator. If anyone who associates danger underwater, they think of this massive white zeppelin looking shark bristling with teeth coming straight towards them with Jaws music playing. And inevitably, any image that you take of a white shark, people are going to enjoy looking at it. Photographer Andy Murch is so enamored with sharks, they're the only species he films. His database of shark images is perhaps the most comprehensive in the world. I started as a diver before I became a photographer. After I really fell in love with the ocean and with sharks, I decided that I wanted to record as many of the animals that I had seen underwater as I could. So I started to build this portfolio of shark and ray images, which was what I was mostly interested in. And after a while, that database grew big enough that I was able to actually start selling the pictures and become a professional photographer. I don't think that my interest in sharks comes from the fact that they're scary or they've got big teeth or anything like that. It's really more of a fascination with how majestic they are, how beautiful they are, how graceful when they swim through the water. They're absolutely stunning animals. And if you catch them with just the right light and on a nice clear day, it's an absolutely magical thing to see underwater. Sharks have a presence, especially if you can make eye contact with a shark. It's very, very engaging. And I think that that same feeling that you get when you're underwater taking photographs of them or shooting video, when that image is presented to somebody above the surface, when they see that, I think that it's very captivating for them too. If you can capture that moment where a shark turns towards you and it's looking at the camera, when the person above water sees that, they're sucked into that image. It's a bit of a fantasy, but my ultimate goal is to try to photograph every species of shark out there. And I'm not just doing this because it would be a fun thing to do or because I have OCD. I think that getting images of all of these sharks will be very useful for conservation purposes in the future. And that's critical to me, that we have those images so that if anybody starts some kind of conservation initiative for a particular species, I'm able to supply an image so that people can really appreciate the animal that we're trying to protect. And one shark species Andy has taken many photos of, the oceanic white tip definitely needs all the help it can get. To dive with and photograph the elusive oceanic white tip, shark advocate Stuart Cove and his crew traveled to waters off Cat Island in the central Bahamas. Like great whites, oceanic white tips need a little incentive to approach the dive boat. You got it, man. This is the bit no one sees and no one wants to do. I don't mind it. This is what our little darlings like to eat, so got to give it to them. All right. Okay. 
with you. Come here, little puppy. Just for you, Ted. So this is our oceanic white tip. The first one to show up. Got a beautiful day. Stuart is perhaps tempting fate a bit, but he's got lots of experience with these sharks. I think we can go in. It won't take long for his friends to come. Baiting and chumming is a controversial practice with all sharks. But the fact remains that the only way to entice the animals is with bait. What are you doing? I'm just having some fun. Stuart Cove's business revolves around shark tourism, and if you're paying to see an animal in the wild, you want to get as close as possible. Wrangling sharks with a baited line is one surefire way to excite the sharks. Oceanic white tips do have a bit of a reputation. They've been implicated in numerous shark attack fatalities, especially with shipwreck survivors in the open ocean. But they have a lot more to fear from us. When these increasingly rare sharks are encountered, they're very small. The few oceanics that remain are a fraction of the size of their historic counterparts. Oceanic white tip sharks have pretty much become the poster shark for shark conservation now. Their numbers were depleted so much in the Gulf of Mexico and it was recorded that there was only 2% left of the initial population. So because of this, they became effectively the mascot for shark conservation. And this is very important because we need those species that we can illustrate how bad it's got. Oceanic white tip sharks are open ocean predators, so unlike most sharks that hang out on different reefs, they rarely come in contact with land whatsoever. They're out chasing tuna or various other migrating species in the very, very deep ocean, far, far from land. And because of this, they've come in contact with unregulated finning in many parts of the world where there's no monitoring. There's no way to protect them because past international limits, fishermen can do more or less anything they want. Oceanic white tip shark, this is a beautiful shark, Carcharhinus longimanus, longimanus being the long, beautiful pectoral fins these sharks have. A really interesting shark because when you see them underwater, you usually often don't see the shark, you see little white flashing shadows off in the distance. And these shadows, it's thought, are actually mimicking the movement of prey fish species. They look a little bit like a far off glimpse of some silvery fish off in the distance. And it's thought that this may actually provide other prey species that these white tips are taking with a little bit of assurance. Oh, it's just a school of fish out there and then bam, Oceanic comes in and hits you. What's happened to oceanic white tips is that we've seen a century of industrial fishing in the Atlantic, and particularly longline fishing, and it's taken them out. Their population has declined 98 or 99 percent. They were once the most prolific shark in the Atlantic, even more so than the blue shark, which is astounding because of the biomass of blues. One of the most enigmatic sharks is the Great Hammerhead. These rare creatures are certainly an unusual shark. Massive animals, their distinctively shaped head separates them from more typical species. And no sharks have more desirable or valuable fins. One of the most consistent places to find hammerheads is the tiny island of Bimini in the northern Bahamas. You know, great hammerhead, you can sometimes have a lucky opportunity to see them, but this here in South Bimini is guaranteed hammerhead action. We're less than a mile offshore, 20 feet of water. So the sharks come very close to, the, uh, to South Bimini, and it's great because it's only a five-minute boat ride to the site. Like oceanic white tips and white sharks, 
hammerheads need a bit of incentive to approach divers. We uh, grabbed a, a huge bag of just some local Bahamian fish, grunts, schoolmasters, little bar jacks. And I'm just cutting it all up into pieces. I'm gonna put it in a bucket with some oil and some salt water, mash it all up, and then when the sharks come, we put it in the water, and it, it's an attraction scent, so we like to call it our shark soup. <laughs> The question remains, though, does baiting adversely affect the natural behavior of the sharks? Most large sharks are attracted to handouts of food. Even just the scent of fish blood in the water can usually bring them into close contact. But does it make them more dangerous? It's just an awesome experience to see these huge animals swimming right up to you and around you. Fantastic. The way I feel about these hammerheads, I've dived with a lot of species of sharks here in the Bahamas, but this great hammerhead is probably the highlight of all the sharks. They are huge, 15 feet long, with heads three feet wide and six foot high dorsal fins, and they stay with us, and they swim right around us very closely. Water is crystal clear here in Bimini and only about 20 feet deep, so you can have a, you know, an hour plus dive. The gentle giants, I don't feel at all intimidated by the sharks. Very comfortable, I don't feel they would bite you. They're not interested in us. At one point I was holding a fish and it came after the fish, I put it behind my back, it went around me to the, my back, I moved it back to the front, it came around to the front. It wasn't interested in biting me, it was just interested in the fish. Even though hammerheads have been proven to be relatively shy and non-threatening animals, there's still that nasty reputation to deal with. Old perceptions die hard. Introducing them to scuba divers might help to change our views. This is such a unique experience here in, in South Bimini with these great hammerheads. I would like to introduce more and more people to it, and particularly photographers. It's such a great opportunity to get incredible images of these huge sharks. Photographers are definitely fond of hammerheads. They are a very distinct and unusual species. Depending who you talk to, there's either nine or ten species of hammerhead sharks in the world now. And by far the most iconic and uh, impressive is the great hammerhead, which can grow to extremely large proportions and is very, very angular. It has this huge, long witch's hat dorsal fin. It's just a very spiky shark when you see it in images. And I think that that's very captivating for a lot of people. In the Bahamas and much of the Caribbean, hammerheads have long been viewed as man-eaters. Although they have attacked humans in the past, it's been decades since one of the animals was involved in the fatality. You need to turn people onto it so they can get the word out that these great hammerheads aren't this indiscriminate killer. Because you think a great hammerhead and you think, oh my god, I've got to get out the water, they're going to eat me. One of the hardest groups to convince that hammerheads pose a minimal threat are fishermen. You know, just yesterday we were in Bimini Harbor trying to get some carcasses to feed the sharks, and this very nice gentleman kindly gave us his carcasses. Couldn't believe we were diving with these great hammerheads. And he was bragging about how many great hammerheads he's killed over the years, strictly for uh, trophies. His understanding was they were terrible killers and they needed to be killed. But we've changed his mind. He won't be killing any more great hammerhead sharks. And the more people we can bring down here and show them how gentle these guys are, the more the word's gonna get out and we can make a difference in this endangered species. Open ocean wanderers, great whites, and other large pelagic species are critically endangered over much of their historic ranges. 
white sharks are now protected in most countries. Other species, however, are not. Oceanic white tip numbers have dropped globally by more than 90%. Hammerheads are targeted relentlessly. It doesn't help that their dorsal and pectoral fins are very large and valuable. Big sharks have big fins. And as most sharks are scavengers, they easily fall prey to baited long line hooks. We have a century now of massive industrial fishing that's gone on in the open seas, virtually unregulated, to the point where most of their populations are severely threatened. They're 85, 90% gone. We have pounded sharks mercilessly. This is the end of the end. So we've had a century of bycatch, we've had directed fisheries, and now with the value of these fins anywhere from $80 to $160 a kilo, we're now with the last of the buffaloes 150 years ago in the ocean. We are now seeing the last of these magnificent pelagic sharks being taken for their fin value. For decades, Conservation groups and researchers have been raising the alarm over the wasteful practice of shark finning. We've been killing tens of millions of the animals without careful consideration of their important role in the marine ecosystem. It finally appears, though, that some of us may be getting the message. CITES or the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species has just won a major battle in shark conservation. This year, five new shark species were added to the CITES appendices, which is uh, fantastic news for sharks. We managed to get three species of hammerheads, great hammers, smooth hammers, and scalloped hammers protected, as well as poor beagle sharks, which are related to great whites, and oceanic white tip. This is a very good start. Of course, it doesn't protect them completely because all it does is stop international trade. But it doesn't mean that those sharks can't be fished out on a domestic basis. This is all sharks. Angel, Mako, Casson is other species, probably hammer. That's probably hammer. Finally, somebody has actually set the bar somewhere. We know the CITES process has its flaws, but at least we've got a starting point for the protection of uh, oceanic pelagic sharks. The celebratory food of a culture is a big deal. You're talking about uh, North American culture, our Christmas turkey is a big deal. Most people don't want to give up their Christmas turkey. In uh, Asian culture, the celebratory value of uh, shark fin soup at, for instance, wedding banquets is huge. The fact is there's a big prestige factor associated with the eating of this product and that's what we really have to shift, I think. Characteristic. We saw this shark within 50 meters of the same site three years running. About 40% of the countries which are taking sharks have absolutely no management plans for any of the sharks they take. They just take and take. There's no allowable catch, there's no limit. You just go out and fish. Even though oceanic white tips and hammerheads are now protected on paper, will the new laws have teeth? The real problem with CITES is it's kind of a coalition of the willing. So if you decide to opt out of CITES, there are absolutely, there are no penalties. So really, where shark protection is concerned, it then goes on to the larger scale of how nations interact and things like trade treaties and so on. Would anybody in the Western world, for instance, step up at an international trade conference and say, uh, we're not going to trade with this country that's overexploiting sharks? Would that happen? Perhaps it should. There's still a long ways to go to bring many species of sharks back from the brink of extinction. Regardless of their effectiveness, the new CITES rules are a big first step in shark conservation. This is one of the largest creatures on Earth. But it's not a whale, it's a really big shark. They're called 
whale sharks, and they can weigh more than 30 tons and be longer than a city bus. They may be sharks, but we don't have to worry. They eat only the smallest animals in the sea. And like other sharks, they are threatened. The numbers have declined dramatically, decimated by the global trade in shark fins and demand for their meat. Marine conservationists Brad Norman and Denny Ramirez study the behavior and biology of these enigmatic giants. At Mexico's Holbosch Island and Australia's Ningaloo Reef, whale sharks congregate each year in search of food. And researchers also gather here to learn more about the sharks and how to save them from extinction. A booming ecotourism industry revolves around snorkeling with whale sharks. But the explosive growth of the industry may be scaring the animals away. And hundreds of miles from the nearest ocean, the world's largest aquarium is home to four growing whale sharks. for at least 60 million years. But we know very little about whale sharks. We see them so rarely. They weren't even identified as a species until the mid-19th century. One of the few things we do know is that their numbers are decreasing. Whale sharks are cold-blooded, warm-water fish. They live in temperate and tropical seas near the equator. These giant sharks are amazing travelers, and they migrate immense distances in search of food. And this is what gets them into trouble. While they may be protected in one country's waters, they've been hunted relentlessly in others. And a single whale shark fin can be worth thousands of dollars. and rich undersea realm. Countless species of marine life thrive here. At certain times of the year, the reef explodes with life. It's called a food pulse, when corals, fish, and other creatures lay their eggs. This mass simultaneous spawning injects so much food into the water column that predators just can't eat them all. Most of the eggs drift away on the currents unharmed. It's a brilliant survival strategy. But the tiny creatures aren't out of harm's way just yet. They are no match for one of the ocean's biggest binge eaters, whale sharks. Along the western coast of Australia, Cape Range National Park and the Ningaloo Reef stretch for almost 200 miles. Perth is a remote city on the edge of a remote continent, but that's not where the whale sharks are. To find them, you must fly another thousand miles north to the tip of the most westerly part of Australia. This is about as far as you can get from anywhere in Australia. Until 1967, there wasn't much to speak of at Cape Range, except perhaps for a few fishermen. The Cold War was in full swing, and the US Navy built a submarine communications base on Australian soil. The radio towers are the tallest man-made structures in the Southern Hemisphere. 
base eventually closed down in the early 90s, and the neighboring town of Exmouth lost their main employer. The economic forecast was grim. The whale sharks, of course, had never left. It took a transplanted village doctor from England who loved scuba diving to help sow the seeds of a new industry. I'm a general practitioner. I had uh, become very keen on underwater photography and bought myself a small cine camera before I went to Exmouth. And I, I was just uh, falling in love with the whole marine environment up there, the coral reefs, the, the manta rays, dugong sharks, all the, the, the creatures that are up there at Ningaloo. Then in one day in March, 1983, suddenly after several hours of searching, we encountered a, a really big shark. I finally got in the water and swam with it and, and filmed it, and I was ecstatic. I was over the moon. I mean, to swim next to such a huge creature, to be able to approach it and get so close, it was just a, a mind-blowing experience. I knew that whale sharks had been seen at Ningaloo before occasionally, but really nothing had prepared me for the numbers that we would see coming in each autumn. And uh, after that first encounter in 1983, we went on in the next uh, two or three weeks to see um, numerous whale sharks, about 20 that season. Taylor had stumbled onto a remarkable annual event. Each year, from March through June, giant whale sharks appeared seemingly out of the blue. Jeff theorized that for a few short months in the Austral fall, whale sharks gathered, attracted by seasonal spawning events at Ningaloo Reef. He didn't realize the potential of his discovery at the time and even thought about keeping it a secret. But his pioneering research and film footage eventually brought the story to the world. Television networks, marine biologists, and eventually tourists began flocking to Cape Range to witness the annual whale shark migration. Taylor is now considered to be the father of whale shark tourism in Western Australia. In the late 80s, a handful of businesses sprang up in the tiny villages of Coral Bay and Exmouth that relied on whale sharks' yearly visits. Animal-based ecotourism is now the number one industry. I have to tell you about a day um, this season. They um, spotted a very large whale shark. Um, our crew estimated it to be probably about 14 metres in length, which is just about the length of the boat we go out on. From April to July, whale sharks are an enormous part of our business. They're very important to us as a community and as a dive center. We have clients from all over the world, and that's especially interesting when you consider how far away we are from everything. Our season so far has been fantastic. We had excellent sharks starting about the beginning of April, and we expect them to run till about the third week of July this year. My first whale shark was in about 1996, and I see this enormous fish swimming out of the blue and suddenly materializing in front of my eyes. It was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had. In Coral Bay and neighboring Exmouth, whale sharks are big business. Much of the local economy revolves around swimming with the giant fish. Today, marine conservationist Brad Norman is joining a diverse group of tourists from around the globe. Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Exmouth Dive Centre and your whale shark adventure of the day. We have had a lot of action out there yesterday with my sister and with five or six whale sharks. Okay, yay! yay! What's going to happen this morning is we're going to hop onto the bus. It's going to take us about 40 minutes. Are we ready?
Whale sharks are the number one attraction at Ningaloo Marine Park at this time of the year, between about April and June. There's more than 7,000 tourists per year swim with whale sharks, so it's a really, really big industry to the region and it's great to get that many people interested in whale sharks and taking the message about their conservation back to their friends and family. The whale sharks are found in deeper water outside the shallow reef. Smaller skiffs ferry the tourists out to the dive boats waiting just offshore. For Brad Norman, the people on this whale shark watching trip are more than just tourists. They're research assistants, helping to unlock the mysteries of this fascinating animal. Swimming with whale sharks, that's what people come here to do. But there are strict guidelines. The maximum number of divers in the water at one time and the minimum safe distance from the animals. Once you've seen the shark, you move to the side, okay? You'll be in front of it, it'll come towards you. Move to one side then turn around and just start swimming alongside the whale shark. Hey guys, I got a whale shark down here. Okay, hands up in group one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Two more who else is in group one? In group one? Group one. Okay, quickly. Okay, go, go, go! The guide's upraised arm indicates the shark's position. This is the perfect opportunity for the group to swim alongside a whale shark. But you have to move fast. So little was known about whale sharks around the world and I got to reading about them. I've been to Ningaloo and I was helping with some other research on fish. Heard about the whale sharks and got very interested in trying to learn more about them. Then the opportunity came up where I could swim with a whale shark for the first time and it really was one of the most amazing experiences I can remember. Jumping in the water into the deep blue, we're in about 90 or 100 metres and looking under the water trying to see something coming at me and then all of a sudden out of the blue come this massive, massive creature. I mean, the size of a bus. It was, it literally was a bus underwater coming towards me and I was just shell-shocked. I was just looking at it go past and uh, it was so graceful and so beautiful. It really made me really want to help this species as much as I could. out there and boats don't stumble onto whale sharks simply by chance. They need a little help from above. Basically how the aerial spotting works is the planes go up and spot for the boats, cruise along the reef, search various grid patterns and then when we find a shark we'll call the boats, give them a position on the reef and then basically talk them into the shark using the clock code, so 12 o'clock at uh, say four or five boat lengths for the boats and talk them in through through about 400 metres in through the shark and onto the shark and they take over once they get a visual. A small fleet of planes takes to the skies each morning during whale shark season. It would be difficult for dive boats to find the animals without aerial spotting. Even though the sharks are frequently at the surface, they don't breach or surface for air like whales do. Sea zone, sea zone, this is Norwest there. Yeah, go ahead Norwest there, sea zone here. Yeah, g'day Craig, I've uh, just picked up about an eight metre shark here, uh, off your one o'clock, about 15 boat lengths. Yeah, right, mate, you just uh, talk me on to it. I'll be there in a second. Yeah, right, mate, uh, if you let me know when I'm within four boat lengths. Roger, will do. 
threats facing whale sharks, I knew they were a species in trouble. Being a uh, marine biologist and somebody very interested in the oceans, it seemed to, to be a perfect match to, to save, trying to help save the, the largest fish in the sea. Whale sharks are such a difficult species to study, really, because they do roam the oceans. 70% of the planet is water and we just can't really keep an eye on everything. There's niches that are important to them. We don't know where those important spots are to protect them. Another day, another whale shark. But which one? Has it been the Ningaloo before? Has it been seen and identified before? Brad Norman and other researchers had noticed that every whale shark had a different configuration of white spots, scars, and marks. We knew that whale sharks have spots and lines all over their body, possibly could be used to identify individuals. It was a case of actually refining that thought. When you're working with thousands and thousands of photographs, it becomes unworkable to try to match things up by eye. Brad photographs the pattern of spots, adding to a growing database of images that identify individual animals. Science and conservation depends on data, and for whale sharks, photography is a primary tool. Like a human fingerprint, each animal has its own distinct pattern of spots. The patterns are complex, but there's something similar in the night sky, the galaxies of outer space. There was an existing technology that could catalog distant stars and planets. NASA's Hubble Telescope utilized an advanced computer program to identify astral bodies. With the help of a computer programmer and an astrophysicist, the NASA technology was modified and adapted. Instead of identifying stars and galaxies, the new program identifies individual whale sharks. The process starts with a photo of an area near the fifth gill slit, and the spots are connected with triangles. The computer program then analyzes the image and compares the information with other whale sharks in the database. People can just go to whalesharks.org and click on the website. There's a uh, report and encounter page, date, time, location, and uh, they can submit a photograph online. There's a little bit of work that we have to do with the processing of the photographs. We run a scan, come up with either a match for a shark previously seen or a new shark. Tourists and divers can become involved in two ways. One, learning more about whale sharks by going to the website. The second way is to swim with a whale shark, take a photo and send that photo with the date and location of sighting. And that'll help us understand more about um, the numbers and the movements of these whale sharks around the world. At Perth's Murdoch University, Brad Norman continues his pioneering work in whale shark identification. His efforts have garnered him the prestigious Rolex Award for Enterprise, and he is now an emerging explorer with the National Geographic Society. At Ningaloo Reef, tourists come for the experience of swimming with whale sharks, and at the same time, they help to increase our knowledge of these enigmatic animals. There's many mysteries to whale sharks. We don't know where they're breeding. We don't know how often they breed. We don't know really where exactly they're migrating to and from and how many actually are out there. These are points that as to date we haven't been able to answer. But as we build the program, 
we raise the awareness, we get thousands of people involved in helping with the research um, for whale sharks, I think we can answer the questions. You don't have to travel to remote Western Australia to see whale sharks. Hundreds of kilometres from the nearest saltwater, the world's largest aquarium is home to four growing whale sharks. This idyllic undersea realm appears to be a thriving coral reef. Rare sharks and rays patrol a sandy bottom. But this isn't the tropical Pacific, or even the Caribbean. It's the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta, and it's over 200 miles from the nearest ocean. Dozens of exhibits house an impressive collection. 100,000 animals represent over 500 different species. Nearly the size of a football field and 30 feet deep, this is the biggest individual fish tank on the planet, the Ocean Voyager exhibit. It holds enough water to fill 10 Olympic-sized swimming pools. And they build it big for a reason. The star attractions here are whale sharks. They join a cast of thousands in the aquarium's most popular exhibit. The whale shark was a real challenge for the team here at the George Aquarium in designing this exhibit. It, it is a huge animal and we had to create an exhibit here, a habitat, where these animals could remain their entire lives and be able to comfortably swim all that time as well. It's 285 feet from one end to the other. And that would give even an adult a whale shark plenty of room to swim without having to turn around in, in a circle. Behind the scenes and out of sight, there's an entire city of pumps, pipes, and filters. Where you're standing right now, you're in the heart of the Ocean Voyager exhibit. Everything in this room is dedicated to ensuring that Ocean Voyager has good, clean, healthy water for the animals. Being in Atlanta, being about five hours from the nearest ocean, we actually have to create our own salt water here on site. We've designed the turnover rate to be about once every 60 minutes. And that means that each drop of water comes out of the exhibit and goes through the entire filtration process every hour. It's all run by computers. 3,200 control points are connected with over 25 miles of wiring. And keeping it up and running smoothly is a massive undertaking. It takes a lot of behind the scenes work to keep this equipment up and running properly. Water in dozens of exhibits, all eight million gallons of it, needs to be kept sparkling clean. And so do the windows. Every day, a team of volunteer divers descend into Ocean Voyager. Window washers with scuba tanks. The cleaning guys go in every morning and they take uh, baby diapers and they wipe down all of the acrylic in the exhibit making sure all the uh, sand and gravel and everything is off of it so it doesn't get scratched and also wiping down algae so it doesn't build up. Today, there's a new group of divers. For the first time, the whale sharks are going to be filmed by an underwater television crew. Really? Veteran cinematographers Tom Campbell and Neil McDaniel had worked in virtually every marine environment on Earth. But this is unlike any dive they've ever done. Salt water and expensive electronics don't mix. Technician Dennis Kaufman prepares the high-tech housing and camera equipment for the dive. Big cameras for big fish. Keeping out of the way of an animal the size of a bus is definitely a concern. But safety divers are more wary of a great hammerhead shark and a couple of very territorial goliath groupers. Everything in the Ocean Voyager tank is huge. All right, guys, today our objective is to clean the windows, and there's going to be some filming going on at the same time. Our time in depth is however long it takes to do the windows, which should be about an hour. 
depth is no greater than 30 feet. Meridius and Jim will be your safeties. So they will be hanging out with you guys and these guys will be covering them. It's definitely the coolest indoor dive you'll probably find in the world. <laughs> and it, it rivals even uh, dives out there in open ocean. And you know, at the end of the day, there's, I, in all my years of diving, I've never seen whale sharks in the, in the wild. And to be able to dive with them here uh, daily is, is amazing. Well, this is the first for us in a big tank like this, huh? I, I've been in, in aquarium tanks, Tom, but uh, they've all been about, I don't know, one tenth the size of this thing. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's going to be pretty wild. Above water, the high-definition camera system weighs nearly 100 pounds and is very awkward to carry. But underwater, it's as light as a feather. The first resident to check out the camera team is the giant hammerhead. Fortunately, he's very well fed. You gotta remember, when you do an exhibit like this, there is no handbook called uh, Whale Sharks for Dummies. We don't have a guide on how to keep the whale sharks. Now, we know a lot about sharks in aquariums, and we can apply that knowledge to this, the largest of all the uh, sharks, uh, when we design the exhibit. But every day is still uh, you know, a learning curve for us. We're learning a lot how fast they grow. Uh, we have males and female whale sharks here, so we're very interested in how their biology and their behavior changes as they mature. We have some great opportunities to learn even more about them because this is like a, a laboratory, a big laboratory, where we can study the whale shark, learn a little bit about its sensory biology. You know, what does it actually see? Uh, what can it smell? Uh, how does it find its food? These are all questions that we can learn here in this aquarium environment, which would be very hard to, uh, to learn in the ocean. That really is something. You know what's kind of neat about it is that we've seen a lot of these fish in the open ocean, but everybody looks so happy down there. I mean, all the fish look happy. <laughs> They're just moving around doing what they do, and uh, it's really something. Have that wide variety, and the whale sharks are fabulous. Really cool. I mean, it's just amazing to be in the water with four whale sharks. That big grouper in the corner, though, boy, he gave me a scare. I was filming the tunnel there, and all of a sudden he showed up, and that thing is big, really big, and he kind of looked at me with those big eyeballs, and I'm thinking, oh, I think I'm in his territory. I'm going to go out of here. These are the only whale sharks in an aquarium in the Western Hemisphere. There's a handful of others in smaller facilities in Asia, closer to where the animals were originally captured. The sharks in Georgia, however, had a lot farther to travel. The Atlanta whale sharks were originally caught by fishermen in Taiwan and were destined for the dinner plate. But the Georgia Aquarium had other plans. We had a good baseline knowledge of how to move animals, we just had to supersize it all. Uh, basically what we did is we found the largest aircraft pallet we could get. We built the biggest box we could build for that uh, aircraft pallet, measured the inside, said okay we need a shark this size or smaller, and that's how we, uh, we, we geared everything toward the size of the equipment that you see. Now, there were a lot of uh, intense moments getting the animals out of the sea pen. We had cultural barriers, language barriers, Chinese, Japanese, English, Taiwanese. We had challenges with equipment the first time out. Uh, of course, uh, then there's permitting along the way as far as aircraft takeoff and landing. So there were a number of intense moments along the way. Yep. Okay, bring it down, bring it down. One of our biggest concerns in moving the animals was the weight of their body on their cartilaginous skeleton. So the only time that we lifted them out of the water was in Taiwan when we moved them into the transport box. Down, down, down. Boats, cranes, huge planes and life support systems. Getting these immense animals from Taiwan to Atlanta safely took tremendous ingenuity, a bit of luck, and a lot of very hard work. It was a logistical nightmare, 
But in the end, it all came together. Remarkably, after nearly two days of confinement in small shipping tanks and being transported around the globe, all the whale sharks immediately responded well to their new home. Feeding whale sharks and other residents of the aquarium and keeping them healthy is no ordinary job. Good nutrition is a constant challenge. The food needs to be of the highest quality, restaurant grade, in fact. And whale sharks eat a lot of food. The whale sharks eat about five kilos of food a day. And that contains krill, squid, silver size, and a gel formula. Fine dining, whale shark style, a la carte. The whale sharks can't be fed together. It would be too chaotic. Each animal instead has its own station. The males are fed from small inflatable dinghies and the females from bridge platforms. Twice a day, these whale sharks are fed and we're feeding them a diet fairly similar to what they might get in nature. We know from our research down in Mexico, they're feeding on small shrimps very small, a couple of millimeters in length. They also feed on copepods and fish eggs. But here at the aquarium, we're also feeding them small fish, small shrimps. When we make a diet that we prepare, we actually add gelatin to it. We grind it all up and make it into a gelatin. We can cut it up in small cubes and add some extra nutrients to that. So twice a day, those animals are fed here at the aquarium. And that was one challenge we weren't quite sure of when we uh, were designing this exhibit. Would they actually feed properly and normally? Each shark has been conditioned to feed from a different colored bucket at opposite sides of the exhibit. They've been very well trained, but the males and females still need to be separated at feeding time. We keep the males and the female whale sharks separated during feeding just to really give them more room. They're very large animals, and they do take a bit of space to turn around um, in order for them to feed. And we don't want them all jumbled up together and, and banging up each other. one of the first people in North America to ever have whale sharks. And so some of the research that we're doing and what we're learning from is, is very new and we're able to share this data with other facilities in Asia. For example, our team has learned how to routinely give the whale sharks an examination, be able to obtain blood work and share these techniques that someday may be very applicable to making a difference for wildlife in wild places. No one likes a needle, whale sharks included. Having the immense animals in an aquarium setting has provided staff with a remarkable opportunity to learn more about the animals. In their state-of-the-art lab, ongoing research with blood and tissue samples helped the aquarium piece together clues to whale shark biology and genetics. Much of the research at the Georgia Aquarium is complemented by work done on the open sea. Scientists and tourists travel to tiny Holbosch Island to swim with whale sharks. But all is not well in paradise. Holbosch is a tiny island northwest of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Isolated, Holbosch Island was once reputed to be a haven for pirates. It became a base for fishermen, and now it's a popular tourist destination. The number one attraction for visitors, whale sharks.
Every summer, nutrient-rich water from the Caribbean Sea flows south across the shallow continental shelf. The currents fuel a massive plankton bloom. Like coral spawning events off Ningaloo Reef in Australia, this feast of zooplankton and fish eggs is a magnet for whale sharks. The sharks attract scientists like Denny Ramirez, a marine biologist from the Biological Research Institute in La Paz, Mexico. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? The whale sharks also draw tourists, lots of them. So you can't... Ecotourism has dramatically changed the economy of this tiny island. Fishermen have become tour operators. This was a village of fishermen and they would see the whale shark every year. But they never thought it would be something important for them. The best strategy to find whale sharks, get out on the water early. It can take hours to locate the animals and there's no aerial spotter planes at Holbosch. Rafael de la Parra is the coordinator of the Domino Project a unique program that partners scientists and tour operators to study the sharks and to regulate tourist activities. And sometimes the best way to find whale sharks is to follow the local tour boats. They are pretty well organized right now. They will take turns and they will try to not bother the animal. They will wait a little and three people in the water at the same time, then they will drift away, then another boat comes and, and drop his people again, and so on. Research and tourism go hand in hand at Holbosch. Operators let the scientists know where the sharks are and relay basic information, such as the sex and size of the sharks and if they've been tagged. But today, there's only one shark, and that creates a problem. Tour operators take priority, and the researchers must wait for their chance to work on the animal. The standard rule is that tourists go first and scientists go last. Finally, the tour boats are finished for the day. Before the shark has a chance to get away, the researchers spring into action. The first order of business is to implant a yellow ID tag. This is a new shark, one that hasn't been seen or identified before. Denny Ramirez wants to find out how whale sharks from around the world are related genetically, where they're going and where they're from. To do this, she first needs photos to identify them. Denny and other scientists at Holbosch send their photo ID images to Brad Norman's database in Australia. Together, researchers around the world are starting to gather a broader understanding of population numbers and global distribution. What's the number? The number of the picture is 44 to 60. To learn more about whale shark genetics, she needs to get a DNA sample. She's an expert freediver, but it's still a challenge to keep up with the big animals. Skillfully, she extracts a tiny piece of flesh with a sharp tool. These small samples are key pieces in a genetic puzzle. Back on the surface, Denny carefully unscrews the sharp spear tip which holds a sample of fatty tissue. The flesh goes into a sterile container filled with alcohol to keep the DNA from breaking down. Good sample? Si. Una muy buena muestra. This sample will join hundreds of others back at her lab in La Paz. The final task is implanting an acoustic locator tag which will allow the researchers to track the shark in local waters. The tag's tether has to go deeper into muscle tissue to ensure it stays in place. It causes the animal some discomfort, and it leaves the scene quickly. The 
The next morning, Denny Ramirez joins a group of scientists from Moat Marine Laboratory and the Georgia Aquarium. These researchers are at Holbosch to gather information about everything from what the animals are eating to local water conditions. It all helps with efforts in Georgia to keep their captive animals healthy and happy in their adopted home. The work that we're doing here in Holbosch complements the work that we do at the aquarium in a lot of ways. Um, so we, we learn a lot in the aquarium setting, um, and then we also learn a lot in the field. But standing alone, neither one of those is really the complete picture. We're actually looking at what they're eating and why they're there. And so we do that basically by taking plankton toes at every place where we see animals that are actually foraging. Yesterday and the day before, it was fish eggs. Uh, normally, it's, it's different types of zooplankton, um, suggested shrimp, copepods, amphipods, things like that. While Denny prepares her equipment, there's time to test water conditions. Please don't put her in gear. It's a lot colder down at the, toward the bottom. Almost 30 degrees at the surface and 24 degrees down, 50 feet down. Once various studies are completed, the scientists begin searching for sharks. But just like the previous day, the research team has difficulty finding any animals. They have to rely once more on the tour boats. Lured by booming ecotourism, unlicensed and unregulated boats from as far away as Cancun are now crowding an already saturated market. Whale shark ecotourism has really taken off in the last five years. If ecotourism on whale sharks becomes too predominant so that in all areas of the world, boats on virtually every animal, I think that the effect is going to be negative in the long run, and I think that ecotourism is going to end up being overall a negative impact on the whale shark population as a whole. I fear that we're going to drive the sharks away from these important areas where they come to feed. As the tour boats wind down for the day, it's time for the scientists to get to work. This is a uh, pop-off satellite archival tag. This tag accumulates information on shark's depth and temperature of the water and the locations of the shark as it, as it migrates. And we insert this dart head underneath the shark's skin and it rides with the shark then. And then at a preset time, the connection to the, between the tag and the tether releases. In this case, in 90 days, it will come to the surface where it floats and then send all of its data back to us in the laboratory via satellite. It appears to be another unidentified shark. First, Rafael de la Parra implants an ID tag. The shark now has a number. In just a few short seasons, the team has tagged and identified over 600 animals. quickly gets her DNA sample. And Bob Huter successfully implants the satellite tag. Whether it's Australia or Mexico, whale shark tourism has proven that a live shark is worth more than a dead one. But is this type of tourism harmful to the animals? The fact that we still don't have a great understanding of the dynamics of their behavior again underscores the importance of us being very careful with this resource and not kill the goose that laid the golden egg. The goose being whale sharks, the golden egg being the economy that it's been driving in terms of ecotourism. We've got to take a very conservative approach uh, in terms of how we allow ecotourism to utilize this resource, just like we would do with fisheries. Although Holbosch Island and other destinations are experiencing some growing pains with ecotourism, 
there are far greater threats to whale sharks. Since the 19th century, whale sharks have been a target of fishermen in countries like India, China, and the Philippines. In recent decades, the growing popularity of shark fin soup has fueled a terribly destructive fishery. Global demand for the tasteless dried cartilage of shark fins has helped to wipe out up to 90% of all sharks. And whale sharks have become a prime target a single fin can be worth a fortune to an impoverished fisherman. But the whale shark's real enemies are the corporations who buy, process, and market the fins. It's a multi-million dollar industry that knows no borders. In 1997, filmmaker and photojournalist Aaron Calmez traveled to the Philippines on assignment she discovered that whale sharks were being killed for their fins, and the fins were processed for export to Asia. She documented the destructive practices and brought the story to the world's attention in her groundbreaking film, The Whale Shark Hunters. Her work exposed an international trade in shark fins and meat that exploited not only the sharks, but the native fishermen themselves. The dramatic film helped turn the tide on the exploitation of the animals. It is now illegal to kill whale sharks in the Philippines, and other countries like Honduras and Belize soon followed their lead. Instead of killing sharks, fishermen began focusing their efforts on tagging, research, and ecotourism. Mexico outlawed shark finning in 2007 and Taiwan declared that 2008 would be the last year of their commercial whale shark fishery. The future is looking much brighter for whale sharks. One of my greatest fears, you know, years ago was that we might have been too late to save the whale sharks because their numbers had been declining so dramatically. I was a little pessimistic at the time, but the outstanding response that we've had from many different stakeholders all around the world is giving me confidence that we can be optimistic about the future of this threatened fish, but we need to be on our toes and we need to continue the hard work we've undertaken. Every day when we come to the aquarium and we watch people come to this exhibit, we know that most of the people who come here are never going to see the ocean or, or even see a whale shark in the ocean. The expressions that people show, sometimes tears, when they see the big window here and these amazing fish come swimming by them, we know we've made a connection. And what gives me optimism is that next generation of kids in particular are going to include the future marine biologists who are going to take care of these animals, protect them where necessary to ensure that we have whale sharks and other big fishes in the sea forever. We're learning more and more about these amazing animals every day and how important they are to the marine ecosystem. Like canaries in a coal mine, they are key indicators of the health of our seas and oceans. And like so many things in this natural world, we are also learning to care about them by getting to know them. Sharks are big business in adrenaline ecotourism. And some thrill seekers deliberately pursue close encounters with deadly sharks. Divers are pushing the boundaries of human and shark interaction, baiting with fish carcasses and blood, <laughs> inciting feeding frenzies, all in a quest to get ever closer to creatures that can kill them. That was f***ing hairy. <laughs> Jesus Christ. After an injury ended his career, Professional bull rider Eli Martinez founded Shark Diver Magazine, and he also organizes excursions for shark enthusiasts. And there's no shark dive more exciting or dangerous than Tiger Beach in the northern Bahamas. Nautilus Explorer, Nautilus Explorer. Nautilus. Captain Mike Lever's most popular trips feature encounters with great white sharks. Mexico's Guadalupe Island, he's trying something completely different, introducing young children to sharks. In 
2008, the first tourist on a commercial shark diving expedition was killed by a shark. The death ignited a firestorm of controversy. Shark advocates and shark attack victims Eric Witter and Chuck Anderson have grave reservations about how far we are willing to go for a thrill. It's reasonable to assume most people would want to avoid sharks, but some scuba divers and snorkelers pay big bucks to get up close and personal with the animals. The bigger and more dangerous the shark, the better. Shark encounters are becoming one of the most popular attractions in the sport, with or without the protection of a cage. gone from being very, very afraid of sharks to having an almost cavalier attitude about them. But have we taken shark diving a bit too far? Many scuba divers are asked if they're afraid of sharks. They're frightening creatures to most of us, but for some people, getting close to dangerous sharks is exactly what they're hoping for. Simply swimming in the ocean means we've become part of the food chain. You can say the same about a walk in the woods, but at least we're in our element, above the water. For shark divers, there is something primal and enticing about entering an alien world where sea monsters lurk. Perhaps the best place to scuba dive with one of the most dangerous sharks is in the Atlantic Ocean in a remote corner of the Bahamas. In the tropics, there isn't a bigger or badder predator than the tiger shark. In terms of the number of attacks on humans and fatalities, they are second only to great whites. The largest one ever caught was 24 feet long. It's a contender with the great white as the largest predatory fish in the sea. At West Palm Beach, Florida, Shark Diver Magazine publisher Eli Martinez has organized a one-week expedition to the northern Bahamas to scuba dive with big sharks. A former rodeo cowboy, Martinez suffered a career-ending injury shortly after turning professional. He then took his passion for dangerous animals to a new extreme. I spent six years riding bulls and doing the rodeo circuit, and it was on one of my stops when I, when I got my pro permit and I started going to pro events that I cracked my hip and I was out for two months so I decided to get my diving certification and went on a dive trip and I'm dropping down and I saw a shark and that was it. Basically uh, hung up my spurs literally and, um, and I started chasing sharks after that. After motoring overnight from the Florida coast and clearing Bahamian immigration, the liveaboard diving vessel Dolphin Dream headed north to remote Tiger Beach. Captain Wayne Smith is credited with discovering Tiger Beach and first introducing scuba divers to tiger sharks. Well, I've been coming out here 27 years now and we came to this area and we anchored up because it was a shallow protected area. Sometimes at night we'd have some dead carcasses and we'd throw them in the water and they'd come up and start feeding on them. And after a while there's got to be such high demand for people wanting to see tiger sharks that we started running these trips. Everybody, uh, welcome to Tiger Beach. As you can see we already have a bunch of lemon sharks swimming around. We prefer everybody dive in two so that somebody can watch your back while you're in the water. Once you jump in, just keep your hands here. Don't start waving them around or splashing. Other than that, uh, we already got sharks here. The pool is open. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Gotta get in there. This is what we nutty people do. This is what it's for. Yeah, my jailhouse tat. <laughs> I didn't actually get it in jail. Any last words, Neil? <laughs> <laughs> Look after my wife and children. When I started wearing the hat, it was to save my hair, and it kind of became my trademark. So I never die without it. The only time I don't is when it's really, really cold and I gotta wear a hoodie, but I'm still trying to figure out how I can make that work. <laughs> Dozens of lemon sharks are a constant presence at Tiger Beach. They're not generally considered aggressive, but they are implicated in over 20 non-fatal attacks on humans. Many sharks, including lemons, can be dangerous given the right conditions. A beautiful animal with piercing cat-like eyes, they are part of the requiem family, which includes other well-known species such as tiger and blue sharks. animal everyone is here to see is the tiger shark. Although not endangered, they are very rarely encountered while scuba diving. It takes some time for the tiger sharks to venture in from the fringing coral reef. They seem at first to be relatively uninterested in the divers or the lemon sharks. But on the first dive of the first day, tiger sharks eventually came closer and made their presence known in a big way. David, that one takes the cake. You, you didn't want to know what was happening behind you. Did they follow me up? I, I was rolling on one. He came right behind you. Tiger? Yeah. I was took a little chew on your tank. Oh. There's nothing I could do about it. <laughs> oh, first dive, first day of the trip, I get bumped by two or three tiger sharks right in the lens, coming right at me. You were turned away from me and this big tiger shark came swinging around and I, he was coming toward me and I'm kind of backing off, backing off. Then he swung in behind you and I guess for some reason he, he decided your tank was something he liked to investigate. So he, he, he went up and he just kind of mouthed it a little bit and you're oblivious to the whole thing, of course. Those are big, rather uh, impressive looking sharks. I gotta say that. He really didn't bump anybody else. You know, he just came back to your housing and and, uh, you know, the tiger shark was just looking around for that food. He really couldn't find it. Probably saw the housing, was looking for potentially a meal or something, and bumped it. But after that, he found what he was looking for and uh, went after that. To attract and keep the big sharks close, you have to use bait. A lot of bait. Most divers rarely see sharks. Animals don't make a habit of venturing close to humans with scuba tanks. Breathing compressed air is a noisy affair, and our relatively large size usually scares them away. To the sharks here, however, we're just another big predator down there for the same reason they are, for the food. We get our fish from the fish market, the stuff they were gonna throw away, um, we feed that to the sharks, so it's a win-win for everybody. We recycle what they were going to normally throw away in the trash bin. We go through about 250, 300 pounds of bait per day. We get a variety of bait. A lot of what we get is uh, what the fish houses have left over, heads and uh, backbones after they sell to the restaurants and the public. And then we also get our, some bait from uh, some of the local fishing boats that get in these bonitas, which are real oily and bloody. And they're not a food fish. Nobody eats them as foods, and they make excellent bait. 
We constantly have to adapt the way we're feeding them because they're, they're clever little devils. One of the ways we do that is with the wrangling. Uh, we tend to get them excited there at the surface. We get the lemons thrashing around because they're so easy to get the bait. And that thrashing around is what's uh, bringing the tigers in these days. big sharks you use big bait. We're prepping a grouper head and what we're going to do is we're going to wrangle in the sharks. We're going to hang this out the back and try to attract the tigers to the boat. We use big heads like this because if we use smaller pieces of fish well the, the sharks will kind of take it away real quick. They got a real thick bone in their head so these we can last with this one piece of bait and it'll, it'll keep us there for a while. dominated this place, but they're definitely sh smaller in the pecking order. When the tigers come in and they want to feed, you know, there's nothing's going to stop them. The lemons will definitely give them away, especially when a big 12, 14 foot tiger comes in, you know, the lemons will, will leave and, and get out of there. The big boss here has got to be the tiger shark, absolutely. You can see here that if, if a tiger shark can get his lower jaw on, on the bottom of this crate, I mean, he'll just snap it in half, and that's what he did here. One of the things that we're noticing is that these sharks have a learned behavior, at least the tiger sharks, where we're taking our crates down there and we're hanging them, and the tigers have learned to chew through the ropes that we have these crates hanging from so that they can grab these crates and swim off with them and at their leisure figure a way to get inside to the bait that we have hanging. And yeah, it's, it's definitely a learned behavior. A couple of local Bahamians coming off one of the small islands out there uh, spearfishing. <laughs> I don't think he knows this is tiger shark infested waters and these guys are out there spearfishing. <laughs> what do you say about that? That's extreme. That's as gnarly as it gets. Jeez. I love my job. Another day at the office. Oh, yeah. Beats riding bulls, huh? Are you kidding me? I live for this. Eli Martinez has found a unique niche in the scuba diving world. His magazine, Shark Diver, appeals to both armchair shark enthusiasts and to those looking for a slightly more hands-on approach. After the magazine started, the reader trips kind of evolved. People started asking us, where do we go diving? Uh, maybe they can meet up with us, or when's our next adventure? I organized our first shark trip, and it worked really well, and we had a blast. Out there in the real world, you know, you tell someone you're a shark diver, and everybody thinks you're crazy. Here, all these crazy people can get together, and no one thinks you're crazy anymore. Martinez frequently dives with aggressive sharks, and has many hair-raising video clips from his expeditions. Mako sharks are particularly fast and frightening and have very sharp teeth. Well, here you can see the bite marks. This is actually after my last Mako shark dive. Makos are one of the few sharks that don't bump divers with a mouth closed. They actually go at divers mouth open. You can see the gouges from sharks as they, they really bite into the glass. As the week progressed, the action at Tiger Beach ramped up, way up. Aggressive baiting and chumming were perhaps a bit too successful. 
handful of tiger sharks became increasingly more bold. Eli had to eventually use his camera as a defensive tool to protect some of the divers. Sharks don't have hands or fingers, so they sometimes ram or nudge objects out of curiosity. And in worst case scenarios, they may take an exploratory bite. It's all about. This is what you hope for, you know? That was f***ing hairy. Jesus Christ. I may have drifted into the other divers that were there, but I turned around and I'm looking straight at the face of a tiger shark, and he wasn't a small one either. Those sharks came in, they came in hard, and and uh, it was it was intense. It got pretty, got hairy there for a little while. I think Eli was trying to come in to protect me because I'm filming one and this other one comes in. It was just, it got extremely hairy. That's what you really want. You know, everybody came back, nobody got hurt, and everybody's got a big smile on their face. Reviewing his tape after the last dive at Tiger Beach, Eli's video camera revealed an encounter that could have seriously gone wrong. This is one sequence destined for the highlight reel. There go. Yeah. Oh, and again, <laughs> and again. <laughs> Gnarly, man, talk about pucker factor. That is what shark diving is all about. <laughs> That's what extreme shark diving is all about. That was an outstanding dive, absolutely outstanding. Uh, tigers, four tigers, uh, nipping at the tanks, biting the cage. The, uh, the food cage, uh, outstanding. that's what it's all about. That's, that's why we came out here. So, huge adrenaline rush, huge. Shark divers are a very small but growing community in the scuba diving world. They are a passionate group and many are staunch advocates for shark conservation. But are they crazy? And do they take their hobby a bit too far? It's exciting to get in and watch a shark in its natural habitat. And I did a lot of reef diving in that, and it kind of got boring after a while, and kind of wanted to start getting to the big stuff and get a little excitement back into it. It's partly an adrenaline rush, um, but it goes a lot farther than that. It's hard to describe until you've actually dove with one or swam with one. Um, they're just such beautiful animals. Uh, they're so graceful and powerful. You know, the more you know about them, the less you fear them. And uh, diving with tiger sharks is great. <laughs> I have done skydiving. I have done uh, some mountain climbing. I do mountain biking. Um, but nothing compares to it. Nothing compares to shark diving and that, that intense adrenaline rush you get when you first see, you see a big shark in the water, much less 10 or 15. I've been diving for a lot of years in a lot of different places, and uh, I've experienced a lot of different kinds of sharks. But tiger sharks are right up there in the pucker factor. I mean, first big one you see, it's like, whoa. Shark divers have a need for a little adrenaline rush. And, and you can kind of see it during these shark dives. If it's, if it's a real mellow shark dive, they're not real excited. But boy, when the sharks get excited, the people get excited. You take someone that's never been in the water with a shark before, that has a positive experience in the water, they're gonna come out as shark advocates and they're gonna be fighting for these animals and they're gonna talk about them in a different light. And that's extremely important because, you know, the world still looks at sharks as the only good shark is a dead shark. At the end of my days, you know, I, I would love to look back in my life and say, you know what, I saved a bunch of sharks. I did my part and some sharks are still swimming out in the ocean. Number one species on every shark diver's list is the great white. And there's no better place on earth to find them than Mexico's Guadalupe Island. There's no doubt sharks have an image problem. Razor sharp teeth, the icy stare, bloody feeding frenzies. It's no wonder they've earned such a woeful reputation. And after all, they do occasionally kill people. 
No species has worse public relations issues than great whites. And no sharks are more popular with shark divers. About 250 miles west of Mexico's Baja Peninsula is the remote volcanic island of Guadalupe. From the port city of Ensenada, it's a journey of nearly 24 hours on the open ocean to reach Guadalupe. Approaching the intimidating coastline of the island, the first order of business is to prepare the shark cages. Keep lots of tension on that line, okay? This is the one that's like a jigsaw puzzle. Here we go. That's it. Just rotate it around a little bit more, please. About a thousand pounds of cage that we're lifting here. In open ocean with a wee bit of a swell going. My goodness. Just beautiful. We put the cages in at night. As soon as we get here, we like to get everything all organized and in the water just in case there's any kind of problems. It's nice to get everything tied up and to get the chum slicks started and make sure that the white sharks know that we're here and we're ready for business at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> Guadalupe is an arid and desolate outpost in the open Pacific. Towering cliffs and rugged mountains rise over 4,000 feet from sea level. 19th century whalers brought goats to Guadalupe as a source of fresh meat. The animals multiplied as intended and eventually destroyed most of the island's flora and fauna. Today, some of the few original inhabitants that remain are fur seals, sea lions, and elephant seals. And life here must be harsh. This is the realm of the Great White. In the late 1990s, long-range fishing boats targeting tuna near Guadalupe began reporting that great whites were attacking their catches. Word spread like a chum slick. Come on, here he comes. Oh, beautiful. Oh! <laughs> the industry started here in uh, 2000 when a boat called the Horizon showed up. Uh, they had heard stories about sport fishing boats not being able to bring their fish in because the white sharks were taking all the tuna. More white sharks than anyone had seen anywhere. So we came down here on a whim. I wanted to see white sharks off the back of the boat. But uh, we got down here, I jumped in the water, I saw these enormous, beautiful sharks. I couldn't believe how fantastic they were. It was just an amazing experience. And at that point, I knew that I wanted to keep on doing this. It was just no question in my mind. And we ramped up from two trips that first year to nine to 10 trips a year. Like the sharks at Tiger Beach, great whites at Guadalupe need to be coaxed with bait. And nothing piques their interest like tuna. Shark baiting 101. You make it smelly, you make it bloody, you make it oily, you get all this good yummy stuff mix it up with your fingers and scrunch it up to get lots of blood. You make sure that you use animals that are endemic to the islands, mackerel and tuna. And uh, we started Chum Slick. We do it in a very non-invasive way, but we make it as smelly and yucky as we possibly can. One way to make sure that your chum is nice and fresh, take a little bit of chum just like this, and we'll see what the mackerel in the water do. Uh, seagulls, mackerel, and a feeding frenzy. That is fresh tuna.
It's one thing to see a great white on television or from the safe confines of a boat. It's another experience entirely to see the animals in their natural element. There simply isn't a single creature on Earth that we're more afraid of. I just couldn't believe how big they are and how beautiful they are. I mean, they're, they're just, they're not, not at all ferocious looking. They, they look like they're smiling at you until they open their mouth. Captain Mike Lever has two young children with a keen interest in sharks, and he's now trying something completely different, introducing kids to white sharks. The inaugural children's trip at Guadalupe included three kids from Mexico and Mike and Marianne Lever's own children, Charlie and Emily. sharks do you think you're going to see? Why? What? Salty. It's what? Salty. Yes, it's salty. It's salty. It's salty. It's salty. It's salty. Right up. Ready to go. All the way down. Go. It didn't take long for the children to get the hang of breathing from a regulator. And once they started spotting sharks, the biggest challenge was dragging the kids out of the water. Shark coming in, left to right. I don't recall what I was doing at six years old, but it wasn't diving with white sharks. I think it was like riding my tricycle around the street or something like that. Well done. That was great. Charlie, it's someone else's turn now, OK? I know Charlie did not want to come up. Every time a shark would come by, Charlie would be the first guy to go, oh, there's a shark right over there. He just did a fantastic job. I am so proud of him. I think he's just had an experience that he's never, ever going to forget. I don't think any of them have had any trepidation at all. It's been fantastic. They've been in the cages, they've seen the sharks, they've tried to help out on the boat, they want to throw the bait, they want to do everything. I mean, that's, you know, if they go and tell 10 kids and 10 more kids, it can't be any better than that. I saw four. Did you get cold at all? Nope. Not at all? Nope. I was freezing. I wanted to come out. <laughs> she didn't want to come out. I gotta go to the bathroom. And she won't come out. And I kept saying up. She's like, no. Up? No. Muy bien, Vámonos por fuera. We brought some kids out here. We're just wrapping the trip, and it succeeded beyond my wildest expectation. Every kid, every one of them, got in the cages, ended up spending hours and hours in the cages. We had to drag these shivering little five and six-year-olds out of the water after an hour or two because they didn't want to come up. They just loved watching the sharks going by. And I can't wait to find out what happens when they get home and they start telling their friends. Dr. Mauricio Hoyos is fascinated with great whites. 
There's no permanent research facilities on the island, so he teams up with tour boats as a ship's naturalist. He's particularly excited to be working on this inaugural children's trip. When I was a kid, I remember that uh, we went to the United States and my father gave me $20 and he told me, okay, this is all the money that I'm going to give you. You have to buy a lot of toys or whatever you want. And there was this small shark and it was $20. I bought it because I really wanted it. And my father was really upset because he told me, hey, that's all your money. You have to, you, you can buy a lot of different toys. No, no, I want that toy and I still have it. Because since I was a little kid, I loved sharks. When I saw the first shark, I, it was like the dream of my life came true. It was amazing. It was a huge female, maybe four meters long. And since then, I have been working here on this island every, every autumn. gain a better understanding of the sharks' local movements and their long-distance migrations, Mauricio utilizes high-tech tools such as satellite tags and acoustic transmitters. These devices reveal startling data about how deep the sharks travel in search of prey. He's observed that smaller great whites at Guadalupe eat mainly tuna, rays, and other sharks, while the older and larger white sharks eat seals and sea lions. It would be extremely hazardous to acquire DNA samples or to implant transmitting devices in open water. Free swimming with great whites would be a challenge and a bit risky. Okay, Jorge, shark, bring it, bring it. Put it right here, right here. Okay, excellent. Outfitted with an acoustic or satellite tag, the sharks reveal their depths, migratory movements and locations, and even water temperatures. At Guadalupe, Mauricio uses acoustic technology to track local sharks. The white sharks at Guadalupe spend more than half of the year away from the island in open water between California and Hawaii. But what they're doing way out there remains a mystery. A few great whites have been satellite tracked to a remote region in the middle of the Pacific dubbed the Great White Cafe. It's thought that thousands of the sharks congregate each year at the mysterious spot. Whether they're mating, chasing tuna, or even giving birth, no one is sure. For such a remarkably well-known creature, we actually know very little about them. But Mauricio Hoyos is determined to find out more. No, the shark is not here. Maybe we can go a little bit to the north, okay? With the luxury of well-appointed tour boats and their state-of-the-art shark cages, Mauricio can also observe the sharks underwater. Photo ID is another tool in the young researcher's arsenal. Each shark has unique markings, scars, and patterns. With a bit of luck, Hoyos will have many more seasons at Guadalupe to answer some of the questions surrounding these intriguing animals. Guadalupe is a protected biosphere of Mexico, but with minimal funding or monitoring of the waters surrounding the island, the sharks are under constant threat from poachers. A set of mature white shark fins can fetch upwards of $25,000 and an intact jaw is an extremely valuable prize. It's an uphill battle convincing impoverished fishermen or foreign fishing fleets that white sharks here are more valuable alive than dead. I love these animals, I really do. These white sharks are amazing. In the last three days, I've had my five-year-old son and my seven-year-old daughter in the water with them, and it was just a thrill. 
and I can only hope that the sharks are still going to be here for them and for their kids and their kids' kids. Nothing could have given me a greater thrill than to have spent an hour and a half in the water with Charlie this morning, having him point out the white sharks to me. I'm very, very fearful that we're seeing the end of these and that even five years from now or ten years from now, there won't be any sharks left. If you don't relish an open ocean encounter with a big shark, you can now scuba dive or snorkel with them in Atlanta's Georgia Aquarium. One of the best places to snorkel or scuba dive with sharks is, surprisingly, the Georgia Aquarium. It's the number one tourist attraction in Atlanta, and their eight million gallon pool is now open. Divers and snorkelers can experience a fisheye view of their immense ocean voyager exhibit, home to some very interesting sharks. across the country, around the world, really is to inspire people to connect with nature. We want to take it to the next level. When you come to the Georgia Aquarium, you're guaranteed to see whale sharks and hammerheads and uh, zebra sharks. It's one thing to look through a window through glass to the animals. It's another thing to be able to get in the water, to be in their environment, to understand what it's like to be an animal in the ocean. If we can get people in there, they become conservationists. They care more. In the summer of 2008, the Georgia Aquarium opened its main exhibit to scuba divers and snorkelers. The first groups to sign up provided a behind-the-scenes look at their experience. Well, the first order of business is we're going to vote somebody off this island, OK? And I have immunity, so you guys have to look at each other and decide who you're going to vote off. A thorough briefing covers safety issues for both the divers and the animals. Species identification, site orientation, and a short video are all part of the experience. state-of-the-art scuba gear is prepared for the divers, but there's still one more briefing. I'm going to run through a few things real quick just to give you a general idea of what's going on in our exhibit today. Uh, also to give you a few guidelines for your safety and for the safety of our animals. It is a rare treat indeed to scuba dive in an aquarium. Only a handful of facilities around the world allow the general public such intimate access to their exhibits. Just pretty excited about it. I just hope they fed the sharks. Many of the participants in the first few days of the program were celebrating birthdays or were signed up by friends or relatives as a gift. Others viewed it simply as a once-in-a-lifetime experience not to be missed. Although there are many unusual sharks in the Ocean Voyager exhibit, none are as immense or impressive as the whale shark. And there's not just one, there's four, each the size of a small bus. 
was unbelievable. You know, you, you dive in the ocean and you have all this beautiful wildlife around you, but it's it's dispersed. It's it's kind of a condensed version of all the dives I think I've done before. It's just an incredible experience to have that much wildlife all confined confined around you at one time. Uh, it's just exhilarating as heck. That was unbelievable. It was not like anything I've ever done before. I've done a lot of diving, but this is this is the bob here. Scuba divers aren't the only people allowed to swim in the Ocean Voyager exhibit. Each day, a group of snorkelers goes through much of the same routine. But instead of descending to the bottom of the tank, they stay at the surface. threat, there's no worry. They look at you, they ignore you. It's a great feeling, especially for a cameraman who doesn't have to worry about getting nipped in the open ocean. This is a great place. This is where I'm doing all my filming from now on. Even though most shark dives are relatively safe, two prominent shark advocates think we may be taking things a bit too far. And they both survived brutal shark attacks. Dr. Eric Ritter has helped to dramatically change the popular perception of sharks from bloodthirsty killers to vital animals that need our protection. A leading authority on shark behavior, Ritter has spent thousands of hours in the water with sharks. He also devotes much of his time to forensic investigation of attacks, or as he prefers to call them, shark accidents. And Eric has intimate knowledge of the subject. After thousands of interactions with dangerous sharks, his luck finally ran out. In 2002, while filming a television special, he nearly died after a large bull shark bit his leg. Although he certainly pushed his luck many times, Ritter has serious reservations about how far some shark divers are now willing to go for a thrill. When we go back to the early days of shark diving, you know, we were feeding the, the reef sharks and everybody was pretty much happy. But in the last few years, uh, these uh, adrenaline junkies, they want a more bigger and faster. And you know, now everybody seems to want to dive with tiger sharks, white sharks, big bull sharks, but it's not a safe scenario. In my opinion, it has gone way too far. It's not a question about if it ever happens, it's a question of when does it happen? And who will be blamed? The sharks. Back home in Florida, one of Eric's new endeavors is the Shark Accident Victims Network. There's a growing need for psychological counseling of bite victims. And today, Ritter's traveling to neighboring Alabama to meet a potential mentor and fellow shark attack victim, Chuck Anderson. Hey, Chuck. Hey, hey how you doing? How you doing? Nice to meet you, family. Same here, finally, huh? Doing OK? Yeah, how about yourself? I'm doing well. A champion triathlete, Chuck Anderson was swim training for a national competition when a brutal encounter with a bull shark forever changed his life. It was 6.38 a.m. in the morning, and I took about two more strokes in the water, and about that time, boom, it hit me from the bottom. And I started looking around, treading water, and I put my face down in the water, and when I did, it was coming up from the bottom at me. And I just instinctively threw my hands out to push off of me. When I did, he took all four fingers off my right hand, and all that was left was my thumb, just like a surgeon scalpel. It just cut them off clean. There was no pain at that stage of the game. So the pen actually was coming through the water at me. And, but as soon as he got past me, he was attached to my arm. And he immediately took me to the bottom. It was about 15 feet of water. And he went into that feeding frenzy where he was just gnashing from side to side, and dragging me across the bottom and, uh, on the sand. All of a sudden, my feet started dragging the sand. And I wiggled out from underneath him, and when I did, I pulled real hard, and my arm just stripped off in his mouth. And I fell backwards into about thigh-high water and ran immediately to the beach and um, knew that I was a very fortunate man when I got there. I was, had a big smile on my face, and the lady asked me what I was laughing at, and I said, Karen, I ought to be dead. I'm lucky. 
A handful of high-profile shark attacks in 2008 created the usual media frenzy. But the death of the first tourist who actually paid for the privilege of scuba diving with sharks created a firestorm of controversy. Have we finally taken things too far? To go to the extreme of trying to challenge the sharks, trying to bait the sharks to come around people and to pay money to do this, it's just not natural. I mean, if you're not educated in exactly what you're doing and you're a novice at it, then you're taking a risk. I'm not in favor of it, uh, each to his own. If somebody wants to get into it, then be aware of what could, the consequences could be, because I promise you, when a shark gets a hold of you, it's not a good experience. This is the first fatality in our sport, and um, it's just something, you know, all of us hope never happens again. I think it made all of us more aware of what could happen. Accidents will change any industry. It makes, you know, us as shark operators more careful with our clients, with our friends, with the people we take in the water. I don't think shark diving has been taken too far. In fact, I don't even think we've scratched the surface yet. There's still a lot of things left to do in the water with these animals. There's still a lot of things left to learn, to see. I'm just tickled and excited to be part of that and to be part of helping to push the sport to the next level. If personal experience leads to empathy and better understanding, there's no question that diving with sharks is a good thing. And even with more scuba divers encountering more sharks, the frequency of attacks has not increased. Whether shark divers are crazy adrenaline junkies, enlightened conservationists, or both, there's no denying their passion for these threatened animals. Many people still share the notion that the only good shark is a dead one. The problem today is that there are far too many dead sharks, and the remaining population is struggling to survive. And if sharks are to survive, we must all become advocates on their behalf. Sharks definitely have an image problem. After all, they do, on rare occasion, kill people. But what's not commonly known is that they're in deep trouble globally. The population of some species has declined by more than 90% due to overfishing and our insatiable appetite for shark fin soup. Larger animals, such as hammerheads, oceanic white tips, and tiger sharks are disappearing fast. There's one place in the world where sharks still flourish, the Bahamas. In the crystalline waters of this island nation, sharks are highly protected. It's illegal to kill them. Stuart Cove's great passion is sharks. Traveling in his small plane, he helps spread a gospel of shark advocacy across the Bahamas. A successful entrepreneur and self-described shark geek, Stewart and his dedicated staff have introduced thousands of scuba divers to these much maligned creatures. Shark tourism is his business, and the most sought after and prestigious job at his operation is shark feeder. Competition for a handful of positions is tough. It's also a family affair. Stuart Cove's teenage children, Sasha and Travis, are both veteran shark wranglers. With a dramatic increase in attacks and fatalities in recent years, sharks can't seem to shape their bad reputation. They could sure use some help with their public relations. Demand for their fins, jaws, and meat grows each year. There is one remarkable country, though, where sharks are not hunted. Shark populations are in trouble globally. 30% of shark and ray species around the world are endangered. It's a demand for shark fins. 
liver oil, and other products that have driven numerous populations to the brink of extinction. The people of the Bahamas take the plight of sharks very seriously. Please. Please, 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 please protect our sharks. In 2011, the tiny nation outlawed all forms of commercial shark fishing and international trade in shark products. The Asian market for shark fins, they look everywhere. You know, anywhere there's a shark, they're gonna send boats. And of course, everybody knew that the Bahamas had this incredible population of sharks. And so they started sending scouts into communities, talking to fishermen, hey, would you like to get involved in this incredible industry? Catch sharks, we'll buy the fins. You know, and it started pretty quietly, but they were in a number of communities. We knew this was something we didn't want in our country. If they could declare it a national park, then... Eric Carey is the executive director of the Bahamas National Trust, an organization charged with the conservation of natural and historic sites. We never ever had a fishing industry for sharks, and so sharks were never under threat in the Bahamas, and as such, we've always had pretty good populations of sharks. The need for the legislation came when the scouts started coming in looking to exploit our shark populations. That's the only time we really felt uh, we needed to offer more protection for sharks in our country. One of the Bahamas' most vocal shark advocates is Stuart Cove. He loves sharks, so much so that he's devoted much of his life to studying and scuba diving with the animals. It's also his business, and shark tourism is booming. From our research, it shows that 40% of the divers come to the Bahamas because of the shark dives. We are doing approximately 60,000 exposures into the water every year with visitors. So it is a huge economic engine and helps the economy. Hotel rooms, the taxi drivers benefit, the shops, everybody benefits from the shark experiences. But that's not the most important thing. What I think Bahamians really appreciate is how important the sharks are for the health of our marine environment. Coordinating the hordes of shark diving tourists that visit the Bahamas each week is a logistical challenge. Many of them hail from cruise ships, making short stops at Nassau. Shark diving definitely appeals to more adventurous types. First shark dive. My daughter said she wanted to do it, and as you can see, she's not here, I'm by myself. <laughs> She chickened out this morning. So here with my family, we can't wait. I'm pretty stoked about it. I think it was a collective decision that it sounded like fun. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you kind of see that and you're like, what a thrill. Of course we want to dive with sharks. Really looking forward to my first shark dive. I feel like a kid before Christmas. I've seen lots of sharks, but uh, I've never had them, as they say, they're going to be up close and personal. So I'm looking forward to that. Shark feeders are like knights heading off to battle. They need a suit of armor to protect them. <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> it's a real knife. We're not faking it, buddy. I'm feeling quite nervous. <laughs> but it's going to be good. It's going to be fun. I think. I'm going to concentrate on keeping my my limbs together. We have some grouper pieces. Uh, that's pretty much the main thing that we have in here today. I think there's also uh, a few snapper bits in here as well. But this grouper, this is a part of their main diet. This is what sharks like. I'm excited. I'm really She's excited. Excitable. I'm excited. <laughs> ready? All right, let's go. <laughs> I love pushing people in. I'm fine if I die. I'm gonna be fine. <laughs> it doesn't take long for the guests of honor to show up for feedings. Many of these sharks have been doing this for decades. They're old pros. 
The more excitable participants are the big groupers, looking for a quick handout. Guests descend to the bottom first and line up around the feeding site. The feeder follows shortly afterwards with the bait box. The sharks actually came like between me and my son. We were sitting like we are now and the sharks came between us. They came over our heads, they came around the sides and, and back to the feeder and it was amazing. They were like right? attacking the feeder, attack them. The shark dive was phenomenal. It was an incredible experience. It was really fun. Definitely one of the best dives I've done so far. It was a lot less scary once you got down there until you started really thinking about what you were doing. And it was just really crazy. I mean, really one of the craziest things I've ever done. I liked when he was tickling them under the chin to make them fall asleep and he would move them around and, and push them towards people and oh, it was fun. I never saw anything like it. Never dreamed it was yeah. going to be like that. The feeder can immobilize sharks, either by flipping them upside down or by stimulating their sensitive snouts. The animals lapse into a state of tonic immobility that's similar to fainting. The sharks are briefly incapacitated, just long enough for guests to get a closer look. Oh, it was incredible. They told us not to touch them, but we did. <laughs> sharks were swimming everywhere. I kept getting nudged. I thought it was my buddy nudging me. Look over, it's a seven, eight foot shark hitting into me. It was pretty cool. It's safe to say that this operation is the biggest shark diving operation in the world. We have made a huge impact on the shark populations, not only in the Bahamas, but around the world. The Bahamas stopped longlining in 1993 due to the shark interaction experiences. And more recently, the whole country has been turned into a shark park. You're not allowed to kill any sharks here, take any parts. You're not allowed to export any type of uh, shark product. And it's this stance that this country has taken is spreading around the world. That was amazing. I never saw anything like it. I had a great time. Crazy. Awesome. awesome. The families divide. The part that was freaky was when they swam straight at you and then at the last minute, like, swam away. But you got used to it. Sounds weird, but you did. It was really, really awesome. Well, I got hit in the head with the tail. So cool. They're so close to you. You want to touch them so bad, but then you're really scared too. So. <laughs> I wanted to so bad, but I was like, no, I, I like this arm. Now we can say we've checked this one off the bucket list. That was awesome. One of the coolest things I've ever done, easily. Give it up for our fearless feeder, Rudy! <laughs> Stuart Cove's two children, Travis and younger sister Sasha, have been diving with and feeding sharks for years. Oh, I wore these my first time. A bit of sibling rivalry developed between them when Travis was recognized as the world's youngest shark feeder. It wasn't long before a nine-year-old Sasha decided she had to outdo her older brother. Today. I'm breaking my brother's world record. <laughs> yeah. What is that? Youngest shark feeder. I've just been diving and with sharks since I was really, really little because growing up with my family being in the business that they are, I spent most of my time on the water either swimming and snorkeling with the sharks. What are you feeling right now? Excited. Happy. Which ones are mine? <laughs> my brother was the youngest shark feeder in the world. Every living moment, he would just rub it in my face that he was the youngest shark feeder in the world and I hadn't even fed. And so I was like, no, this just can't happen. And so on my 10th birthday, I got out of school on a Wednesday early and I went down and I fed and I was so scared. 
Well, my kids started diving at a very young age, uh, started snorkeling with sharks at a young age, and diving with sharks from when they were eight years old. So my daughter, Sasha, they're very competitive, my children. When she was 10, she wanted to be the youngest shark feeder in the world, so we took her in the early morning and let her feed the sharks. And uh, so right now, as it stands, I think she's the youngest shark feeder in the world. One of Sasha Cove's friends from her school in Canada is also a veteran scuba diver at only 14. Filmmaker Danny Morrow's daughter, Samantha, was also exposed to the underwater world at a very young age. My dad, ever since I was in a high chair, has been showing me his shark documentaries and teaching me to love the water and the ocean and all the animals in it. I have to admit it, Sam seems to be a bit of an adrenaline junkie and if it's not climbing trees or doing flips on a trampoline, she's always into doing something scary. I've been filming sharks for about 20 years now and I think through osmosis she's kind of developed this fascination with sharks and I think she wanted to take it to the next level and the next level is to actually get in the shark suit and get right in with the sharks and try and feed them. After hearing stories about Sasha and her shark obsessed family, the two girls forged a common bond. It was only a matter of time before Sam decided that shark feeding was something that she had to do. Accustomed to sharks before attempting to feed them, Sasha encouraged Sam to try a slightly tamer encounter. At the famed Atlantis Resort, guests can walk with Caribbean reef and nurse sharks. First of all, I introduce myself. My name is Santiba. Okay, I'm going to be basically one of the instructors. I'm going to give you the briefing and let you know exactly what's going to be going on inside this tank. First of all, you have 22 sharks inside this very same tank here, okay? Not aggressive, so nothing to worry about. We have the Caribbean reef shark. There seems to be a boundless fascination with sharks, especially for kids. Perhaps they don't have such deep-seated fears as adults. Most of them never saw Jaws. Okay, guys, so basically that's it for the briefing. Are you all ready for a great shark dive? Yeah. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Like scuba divers, guests on the shark walk breathe compressed air. But instead of using regulators, they breathe with a state-of-the-art helmet. Glass viewing ports in the helmets provide an unobstructed view of the resident sharks. At the resort's Mayan temple, visitors can also rocket through the shark exhibit on a water slide, or slowly raft down a river while surrounded by sharks. Dive, girls. Awesome. Definitely a different experience than diving. It was really neat to have the helmets on. Yeah, tomorrow we're gonna put the chainmail on and do the real thing. <laughs> I'm excited. Awesome. One of the most coveted jobs in the dive industry, and particularly here at Stewart Coves, is becoming a shark feeder. Not only is it potentially dangerous, but it's very exciting. You get up and close and personal with these animals. And one of the things we're very proud of is we have women shark feeders. 
it's a macho type thing. You're getting down there, you're feeding these sharks up to 40 at a time, you're getting beat up, pounded. It's like being a linebacker. And for women to do it is really quite something special. I was working a job I hated in England, and I was a diver. And I decided, why not go professional? Found Stuart Cove online, and they accepted my application. And here I am. Once you're here at Stuart Cove for a while, you get the opportunity to uh, train as a shark feeder. And when you're a shark feeder, you have to get your hands a bit dirty. We're going to cut the bits nice and small to about the size of a hand. Uh, the reason we do that is so any kind of size shark can consume the piece without dropping it. Obviously, we don't want bait to be flying around when we've got customers uh, in the situation. So uh, we make sure that any kind of size shark can just swallow the piece whole. We only feed them a very small amount. Only a couple of individuals get fit. Uh, and it's only four to five pieces uh, amongst 40 sharks. So we're giving them only under a percent of what they eat every day. Uh, so it's actually just like a little reward for them. We're just rewarding their polite feeding behavior when they're around us. This isn't exactly the most glamorous part of the job. Uh, you go home smelling like fish and chain mail. Not exactly very nice, but you do get used to it. And on a really hot day, it can get pretty stinky around here. Before attempting to feed reef sharks, Sasha Cove and Samantha Morrow joined Charlotte Faulkner on a scheduled shark dive. Hi, I'm Sasha. Hi, Sasha. Nice to meet you. I'm Charlotte. Hi. Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you, Sam. I'm Charlotte. You excited? Yeah, super excited. It's my first bohemian shark dive. All right, guys, have you got all your gear together? Yeah. yeah. Everything's on the boat? Uh -huh. All right, let's go. We're going to head on out to the site. Awesome. All shark feeders at Stewart Coves are required to don protective chainmail suits. This is chainmail made of titanium. It's all handmade, so it's very, very expensive. Uh, each chain is interwoven by hand, so very, very cool stuff. Um, sometimes the teeth do pass through, uh, but it does protect us from the majority of any bite that does happen. Ugh. Detailed briefings are also part of the job description. Now there's a number one rule on this dive is no hand movement at all. It's really important we don't move our hands around like so. Our hands are going to be crossed, obviously, on the railing or holding a camera like that. That's the only ways you're going to be, okay? Once you're all back on board, all safely, I can come on back, hopefully, with all my fingers and toes, okay? So I, I never get sick of this. I've done it a hundred times more than that, but it's always different. Shag's behavior is different each time. So you learn something each time. The kids and other guests descend to the feeding site before the action begins. It's showtime. The Ray of Hope shipwreck is the ideal staging ground for a dive like this. It's a relatively small and contained space where divers can gather around the port deck railing. It's still close to the action, yet far enough away to safely observe the feeding. We're trying to get them to do polite feeding, polite feeding behavior where there's no aggression at all around humans, and the food that we give them is like a positive reinforcement for that polite feeding behavior they're showing us. And as the feeder, we try and keep the sharks in that polite feeding uh, behavior during the whole feed. Sharks are just such majestic creatures. They live out there and they're so strong and graceful and beautiful and they can cause so much damage if they really want to, but they really don't and they have such a bad image. I feel so strongly about sharks. They're my favorite animal by far. Our dive can change people's attitudes from a negative perception of sharks 
into a positive perception. And we see this change just in one afternoon. And they come on up and they just have this love and appreciation for sharks, which is such a positive message we need to spread. The Bahamas truly are a shark haven. Woo! Another day at the office. Woo! <laughs> so now that you've seen the sharks, tomorrow we'll teach you how to feed them. And it's going to be pretty awesome. Cool. Yeah. All right, Sam, so how was it then? Oh, that was amazing. I don't know how you could do that so close. That's the first step, getting on one side of the railing. Now you're going to come on the other side and feed them. What do you think? Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Once in a lifetime thing. After the Atlantis shark walk experience and a thrilling demonstration of shark feeding, the two 14-year-old girls were ready for a bit more excitement. This is your big day, last chance, back out. Well, this is my first time actually feeding, so I'm a bit nervous. Are you sure? Last chance. This is a little bit out of my comfort zone. Australian shark feeder Terry Harrison was charged with helping the girls gear up and to keep them safe. Older brother Travis also joined the group as a safety diver. My kids grew up around the dive shop here, and so from the time they could work, they were aware of sharks. And they have no fear of sharks. You know, it's so important these youngsters getting out there and interacting with sharks if the kids aren't scared of sharks, and the kids are showing that the sharks aren't this indiscriminate killer that the media has shown over the last few decades, we know that if sharks are interacted with in a sensible way, they're not gonna eat you, they're not gonna bite you. Today we've got something real special happening. We've got two little gnarly chicks coming out, and they're only 14 years of age, so if I had this opportunity, I definitely would've jumped at it. <laughs> Well, you know, it's sort of like playing football, except the other players have teeth and they can get really vicious. <laughs> I bet. If you are bitten on the arm or anywhere, just, uh, I'll be there, so I will stop it from doing whatever it needs to. But just pull your arm nice and close, okay? These uh, sharks are scavengers, so mm -hmm. as soon as something starts fighting back, they're like, nah, I ain't into this, mm -hmm. and they tend to let go. But remember, we're going to be wearing chain mail, okay? The idea of chain mail is when the sharks bite down, all these tiny links come together and stop the teeth from penetrating our skin. A lot of the time it works, okay? Mm -hmm. If a shark jumps onto your arm and his teeth get caught, he's gonna panic, okay? Uh -oh. So when they panic, they usually pull away and their teeth get stuck. So we need to be mindful of this. You happy? You want this spider or? Yeah, okay. Both Samantha and Sasha were a bit smaller than typical shark feeders. So some minor modifications had to be made to their protective suits. Um, we taped the hands this time so then the chain doesn't fall off her. She has really little hands. So we put the gloves underneath so that then the chain won't rub on her and then the tape just keeps the chain in place. And it looks tough. <laughs> Even Stuart had to wear chain mail. I might not get bit, but I might drown with this stuff on. It's so heavy. I'm usually so macho, I don't need this stuff. I laugh at shark's teeth. <laughs> now you won't be laughing when you get a nice bite in the calf. We may have our future shark feeder here, darling. He'll be back, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, man. Perfect. Okay, fingers. Beautiful. That is my spear for the day. It's like the hilt is actually like a hilt of a sword, so I'll protect Sam pretty well. Don't stab me with that, Sasha. <laughs> so right behind us is the Ray of Hope shipwreck. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go down with the bait box. I'll bring it down to the bottom, and then I'm gonna let you guys feed a few pieces each to the sharks. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna spear a piece of fish, and we're gonna bring it up. We don't want to hold it up like this so the shark swims down and impales it. Wanted to take it off to the side. A shark might bite your hand and their teeth are small enough that they can get tangled in the chain mail. If that happens, you want to lock, hold tight. 
because they'll, they'll start to roll and shake and they can actually cause tissue damage. So if you just hold tight, it's eventually gonna let go. Terry's gonna take you down and pick a good spot on the wreck where you probably have protection behind you. Then I'll bring the bait down. I hope this fits properly. Okay, Sam, there's no turning back now. You did ready? I'm definitely not ready. <laughs> Too bad, so sad. Let's get in. Dad, did you tell mom I was doing this? <laughs> hey, Travis, you ready to go? All right, Dad, let's do it. Stuart Cole quickly initiates the feeding. Following a few demonstrations, he passes the honors to Sasha. In a short period of time, the action ramps up, way up. After some high adrenaline shark feeding, it's finally Samantha's turn. Amazing. She's just such a natural with them. She did not flinch at all when we went down there. She just went straight into it. It goes pretty well for the novice shark feeder until she gets bitten on the hand. Fortunately, the chainmail did its job and protected her from injury. It was incredible, my first time feeding ever, and it was a very scary experience, but I'm so happy I did it. Some of these sharks were accidentally caught by fishermen. A few of the animals still have fish hooks embedded in their mouths. The only way to remove them is to employ tonic immobility. Temporarily incapacitated, it's quick work for Stewart and his son Travis to remove the hooks. Man, it was crazy. The kids are fabulous. There's so many sharks. That was ridiculous. A lot of energy down there. It was really cool. That was pretty scary, but it was really fun. Sam, you did fantastic. Gosh, they didn't invite you too hard, did they? Yeah, one bit. So that's the tooth of a shark that bit Sam. Yeah, so uh, that situation was pretty unusual. You can see actually the tooth mark right here, where the chain links have come apart. As the shark bit down, that little tooth got stuck in there. But now, Sam's got a souvenir and a cool story as well. <laughs> yeah, so for not. sure. Yeah. Show all my friends at home. And we got some pretty awesome stories to tell at school, definitely. The girls are amazing. We have two for sure here. Stuart, what's with the two coffees? It's early in the morning, and uh, I'd like to be awake when I fly. Today we're gonna load onto the, the Baron. We're gonna fly up to Grand Bahama to Freeport, and then we're gonna go out in the specialized boat. We're going 25 miles uh, to a place where we know the way there's tiger sharks. Hey, Stu, how are you doing? Good, Jim. You ready for this flight up to Tiger uh, I Beach? I can't wait to eat those tigers. I'm going to go see the big sharks. We're going to go on this little plane here. This may be more dangerous than diving with those big sharks. 
spread out over an immense area. The best way to travel throughout the Bahamas is by plane. Many of the islands have tiny landing strips, suitable only for smaller aircraft. I became very interested in sharks after working on a couple of the Bond films where we were wrangling tiger sharks and then creating uh, shark diving experiences off of New Providence. I was so excited about it, I wanted to get involved with different species. And the Bahamas has such a healthy population of sharks, and having a plane enables me to fly to different islands to interact with these different sharks. From Grand Bahama, even with a fast boat, it's still a lengthy journey to infamous Tiger Beach. So what we've learned about the tigers is they're very opportunistic eaters. We want to have a lot of awareness when the tigers are around. As long as they're swimming around us, and if they come too close, you can push them away. But I think if they get a little bit of a taste, you could have a problem. Gotcha. You guys ready to go? Let's roll. My father was an avid diver when I was a wee one, and his best friend owned a dive shop in Nassau, and they taught me to dive when I was five. When I was a, a young man on vacation, I'd always work on their dive boat as a gopher. You know, go for this, go for that, hand the fins out to the guests, and they would let me dive. I'd just go off and dive by myself. As a young teenager, we would go out and we'd meet tourists, and meet friends, and we would teach them to dive. So by the time I was 18 or so, I was a well-seasoned dive instructor. This is what we call Bahama Blue. Prettiest water in the world. Got a lemon shark already. Some fresh wahoo with some guys just caught. This is what we're gonna use to chum with. You have right here an eight, 10 foot lemon shark, and we can have up to 40 of these animals at the same time. Well, you know, this is a little more serious diving today. We have to watch our back. Tiger sharks are one of the top predators, like a white shark in some ways. One of the main animals of prey for the tigers here are the turtles. And you can see them sneak up on the turtles and then they'll, they'll, they'll bite their fins and they'll try to get underneath, but they sneak up on them. And I, I think that's what they do with us because we always find them sneaking up on the divers. They come from behind. I'm gonna watch your back. Okay. You watch mine too though, because they're always sneaking up behind. I'm not getting any younger, but diving with these sharks, man, it's the best thing I can do. I, I never get bored of it. Tiger Beach experience, we had a spectacular day. The water was flat, calm. As soon as we got to location, we had two large lemon sharks. Stu set the uh, box up at the bottom, started gently putting the bait into the water. One big tiger, female, I think, came along, and then uh, a few more lemons came along. And I said, this is pretty easy, I'm doing great. And within 10 minutes, we had a big tiger shark, and we started to interact with those three sharks. When we get in the water with the tigers and the lemon sharks, obviously we, we draw them to us with a bait box. And we take bait out of the box and we feed it to the sharks. Uh, it's very controversial, but you're not gonna get the kind of uh, interaction and close encounters without using food and chum and baiting in these sharks. And we bait them in so close that we can actually touch them and rub them, and they seem to enjoy it. All of a sudden, two tigers, three tigers, four tigers, 15, 20 lemons. I'm going, gee, this could look really good. And then they start coming two feet off the bottom. And they're like, are they are coming at my feet? So I've got the camera right in their face following them. And then they're crossing each other right in front of, right in front of my feet. I'm going, this is okay, right, Stu? Oh yeah, this is great, Jim. Just keep going, I'm, you're doing great. And then after a while, I'm spinning like a top trying to keep an eye on these things. So. Uh, it goes from controlled shooting to totally uncontrolled shooting. Do you try 
trying to watch a tiger shark and this one over here one over there and all of a sudden there's one going between your legs from behind fantastic a solitary mostly nocturnal predator tiger sharks are second only to great whites for the most recorded attacks on humans they often roam close to shore, creating the potential for encounters with swimmers, surfers, and divers. Unlike great whites that mostly prey on seals and sea lions, tiger sharks will eat virtually anything, including us. Stuart Cove is certainly well acquainted with sharks and doesn't have any qualms about feeding them. But handing out pieces of fish to 10 to 15 foot tiger sharks without chain mail or the protection of a cage is a bit extreme for some people. These animals are habituated to the presence of divers and used to being fed. But the small scraps of food they receive are a tiny fraction of their daily requirements. It's more like handing out treats to really big dogs. Dogs that can bite you in half. That was unbelievable. I've done several dives out here over the years, and that there was, to me, the best. But that was a fantastic dive. And I didn't really see any super aggressiveness down there. And you were touching them, and, and uh, you seen them moving them along a little bit like big dogs. You get your share. And they weren't pushing and shoving. They are kind of lining up for their food. What got them ramped up there near the end was there was a big piece of wahoo carcass, which is very bloody, and I took it out and I was trying to give it to the tiger shark, but the lemon shark grabbed hold of it and went taken off and shook it and the blood went everywhere. And you could see everything changed. The, all the lemon sharks went after them, the tiger sharks kind of arched their backs a little bit. And at that point, I think I felt a little bit uncomfortable. But most of the dive with those sharks all around me, I mean, they're around my legs, on my feet. I had no protection on my hands, no chain mail on my body, but I didn't at any time really feel in danger. Wow, I just love my job. For a fish with such a vicious reputation, sharks in the Bahamas make a disarming first impression. They're not exactly cute or cuddly, but sharks here simply go about their business, as most predators do when left undisturbed. We're generally not on their menu, and they view us as just another fish on the reef. Tourism accounts for nearly half the gross national product of the Bahamas. And diving is a multi-million dollar industry with sharks an ever-increasing draw. It's abundantly clear that a live shark here is worth far more than a dead one. The Bahamas is one of only five small nations that have completely banned commercial shark fishing. Multinational fleets are not welcome in these waters. It really was a big deal that a small country like the Bahamas, you know, joining other small countries, took on the giants and, you know, determined that this was something that had to be done. We are very optimistic that we're going to be able to influence the larger countries and get them to see why it's important to protect sharks. So I think the future is bright. And as a small country, we really feel proud that we stepped up to the plate and we salute the government. You know, here in the Bahamas, we're the leaders in shark conservation. We realize how valuable a shark is, not only to the economy, but to the environment. And hopefully other countries have realized that a live shark is gonna keep their waters healthy, keep their fish population strong. A dead shark isn't gonna do them much good. It's only good for them one time. I am very proud to be a Bahamian and proud of our country and the stance that it has taken in conservation and protecting sharks. In 
It's estimated that a single live shark is worth as much as $200,000 in tourism revenue over its lifetime. Its ecological value is inestimable. Studies in the Bahamas and the Caribbean have shown that where sharks are keystone species, their depletion could ultimately destroy coral reefs. Their role in the food chain is crucial. If the sharks are gone, so too goes a rich ecosystem, one that feeds local people and keeps visitors coming back. I've been blessed to grow up with all this healthy marine environment here in the Bahamas. Lots of sharks, with oceanic white tips, hammerheads, reef sharks, tiger sharks. I hope that they're here for my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, for many generations beyond that, that they can enjoy this wonderful resource. And I am very optimistic that many of these species that are now threatened are going to be able to bounce back and that human beings are going to understand how important it is to live in balance with these very important creatures that inhabit our waters.